All right, ready? Uh, you we're doing this now. If you're up for it, uh, you didn't tell me that we were actually gonna do it. Uh, but yeah, I can I can muster some some gusto. Muster some gusto. The gusto muster. I like that. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I would it. buy that. I, I don't know what it is, but guess. I'd buy it. I don't know if it was a jar lame la- la- labeled. What was it? Brown Gust- brown muster gusto. Must guster. Gust- muster some gusto. <laughs> guster some gusto. Gusto muster. <laughs> My brain is like, what are you? What are you talking about? Okay. Anyway, Tally Forth and Sally Ho. All right, let's let's muster the gusto. Yes. Right. Gust. I want to say. I keep wanting to say guster, guster the muster. Gusted gusto. the muster. Guster the muster. Oh my gosh! Whatever. Okay. This is a great start here. <gasps> Welcome, everybody, to episode number 121 of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. I am Drew Brown. And we're here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about what you can expect from your pens as they age. Uh, the best pens to buy for shimmering inks, our top sentimental pens, the Fude versus Flex Nib for drawing. Uh, if the vintage pen market will ever be strong enough for Goulet pens to start carrying vintage pens, question mark. And we're going to be featuring our marketing specialist, Janea, who is just a bright personality. And I think you're really going to enjoy getting to meet her. She's so. very boring. <laughs> Yeah, and you just really keep it toned down. I'm too. also very she boring. Doesn't yes. doesn't uh, it's respond gonna be, to your. It's gonna be so boring. Yeah, you at all? Yeah. Uh, cool. Well, it'll be a fun episode, and we'll start it off with feedback. Feeding back to us today. Mm. Oh darn! I meant to get some uh, notes. When you read your thing, I'm you gonna run out and get. Uh, or you can just, just go get it now. We can, no, no, no. Yeah. You can just you can do. Well, okay. Yeah. Well, I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> I will sit here. Dead air. All right. All right. <clears throat> so starting over the feedback segment here. <sighs> yeah, I'm definitely <clears throat> out of breath. Yeah. Do we have it in our handbook that running's not allowed in the building? I was just running and Jessica told me that's not allowed. And I said, I don't think that's in the handbook, Jessica. I, I don't recall running's explicitly. I think there's like general things about just being safe and stuff like that. I was running safely, I promise. Oh, I have no doubt. <laughs> you're, okay. such a, you're such the athlete, you know, you're just a lot of it, well, experience my, running. My energy doesn't match my... Uh, Your physicality. My physical health, yes. <laughs> That's at odds with each other. Yes. I have yes. the energy of a much healthier person. And likewise, you wouldn't look at me and think I'm as active <laughs> as I am. I sure would. Yeah? You don't look unhealthy or inactive. You don't, you don't, present, you don't present a sedentary facade. But like when I'm like riding a road bike, my body type doesn't look like, that guy rides a road bike a lot. I would agree with that, <laughs> sure. I would say like, you know, that guy, you know, lifts some weights. That guy... Hauls some logs. That guy hauls logs and carries yeah. rocks and buckets. There you go. That I would say. You've got a rock bucket carrying sort of. I have a rock bucket visage. Physique. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so feedback as far as that goes, we don't usually we do get letters, Brian, and we do, we do appreciate them very, very much. Um, reading them is a little bit more of a to do on the pencast. Uh, but I did want to mention that we don't always get letters from kids, and I wanted to say thank you to uh, Joseph and Sarah who wrote us some delightful, delightful letters in some of our favorite inks, um, intentionally choosing a blue ink for you and a green ink for me. I so feel seen, yeah. Yes. So <laughs> we got them. Thank you so, so very much. Very cool. Um, it means quite a bit to us. So cool. Gratitude there. They mean a lot to us. Yes. We do, get, it. we do get handwritten letters from various people. We try to respond, but can't always. So no. just, you know, we always hesitate to like talk about that too much because yeah. we don't want to like they, they will absolutely encourage be, or like, absolutely you know, be read, that, but, absolutely yeah. be appreciated. Yeah. Um, and I respond as I am able to, but I'm not often able to, yeah. so. Yeah, but we do um, appreciate them. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. And uh, once again, joining us is left-handed clogger. Mm. Uh, who said, I was shocked when you mentioned that the new Schaefer bottles can't be found anymore, crying face. Last week, we talked about there there were new Schaefer ink bottles that were kind of the reminiscent new, of the, the old, old ones. ones. Yeah, okay, yeah, that yeah. had that little glass lip in there that acted as a little mini inkwell. Uh, left-hand clogger says, I bought four bottles in 2022 from a UK seller, and I love them. I already finished one bottle. 
They're indeed great for both dip pen use and for filling with the little internal inkwell. Here's hoping they bring them back again, again. And I did confirm with um, uh, educated parties that they were a thing and now are discontinued once oh, again. Okay, so, so we missed it. Yep, they brought them back and then they went away again. Dang so it. Hopefully they'll come back. Okay. I hear Schaefer has a new distributor, so who knows? Things could happen. Um, Emma C says, in regards to filtering via nib size that we talked right. about last week. Right. For a filter for nib size, maybe you could go with the length of nib, like ranges of the measurement in millimeters or something from the grip section to the tip. Then you don't have to complicate things by trying to explain all the different numberings of different brands and stuff. But mm -hmm. people can still select pens with similar size nibs. It doesn't solve the swappability though. Um, mm -hmm. We do actually measure every pen that we sell from grip to nib tip. So if you wanted to know, mm. it is there, but we don't have any way to actually sort by them. So it wouldn't be impossible. The but data, that, yeah, we, we are, we have the data. I was gonna say like, we have that in the tech specs under every mm -hmm. product. So exactly. that would actually be a lot easier to create as a filter on the site. But is that, you know, is like cap diameter mm. or something that should also be, you know, like we have all kinds of different yeah, numbers. Yeah, how do we know which one is important? But we did get a number of people that said, yes, that is important to me. Interesting. Um, okay. Which you asked for. So that that, okay. that is there. It uh, is also, important to Emma, at least. Shout out to our Pen Plaza tool, which is also helpful for comparing visually, like the, especially like the nib sizes and then grips and stuff like that. Because mm -hmm. we photograph every pen identically you know, in a grid so that you can see how one nib size will compare to the other. So it's, you're not just looking at a number or a picture in isolation. It's sort of like the swab shop, how you can compare different swabs of ink. We have different pictures of pens. So you can see the length of nib and grip and all that kind of stuff. So yes, not a lot of people know about that tool or use it, but it's, it's in there. It's under, under our resources. Um, let me just make a little <clears throat> note here. Tenmin Nook. There you go. No, Plaza. Plaza, Plaza, not Nook. There you go. Great. The pen nook. Um, yes. <laughs> so I can link for y'all. Yay. All right. Finally, sp painted spaceship. Hmm. I'll undoubtedly pop to pee on that one. Mm -hmm. Drew, I feel the same way about being in active weather. What a great way to phrase that too. Especially snow, because it completely changes the character of the landscape around you, both in a visual sense, but it also changes how sound travels. I love it. Mm. Painted spaceship, you are absolutely right. We talked about active weather and how being in weather that is happening all around you is mm -hmm. really kind of serene and comforting. Even though it might look chaotic, it's a pleasant reminder that you're in a very living world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think sometimes we can forget that. But snow, oh my gosh, for sure. Yeah. Um, snow and rain, it just, everything feels clean and just, it, it does muffle sound in unique ways and it's delightful. Mm -hmm. We recently got some snow here in central Virginia. We did. First and like meaningful snow we've had in three years, yeah, I think. Yeah, that was quite nice. Yeah. And then this week we're looking at record highs. So yeah, it's going to be like 71 degrees Fahrenheit and rainy. So that's not weird. And then it's going to get down in the 40s and then it's going to be back up in the 60s. So we're not going to get sick at all. It's going to be awesome. Weird. All right. I got one from Penguin 1780 RE composition books. If you're looking for something cheap or emergency paper, look for where it's made. Composition books made in Vietnam or India, sometimes China, but that's hit or miss, tend to be found at dollar stores and grocery stores and are very fountain pen friendly as school children still use fountain pens. I vastly prefer better paper, but if it's for work, it's a step up from the usual. That is kind of interesting. It is interesting. I mean, it is a broad stroke, like China's a big country. I can't imagine I've they're heard that. all sourcing their paper from the same place, but you know, might be something for you to look at. So that's kind of interesting. So. Yeah, a lot of folks wrote in and mentioned that uh, they've had luck with certain drugstore composition books as well. So mm -hmm. they're definitely out there. Uh, you yeah. just got to experiment a little bit. But the great thing about drugstore composition books is that you're not, you know, really taking a ton of risk. Those things are all probably Pretty like cheap, yeah. $2 or less. Like, yeah. So yeah. Give, them, give them a shot. I'm sure there's some good ones out there. Cool. Uh, Cringe Central says... I zoned out and heard them talking about pacifiers for kids and the switch from pacifiers to a new Banu pen threw me off guard. But then I realized this is a pen cast. So I just accepted it and kept on watching as if nothing happened. There you go. Yeah, yeah, that's accurate. You can't skip a beat here with us because if you don't pay attention for a few seconds. Or you can. You could be in a totally different You'll place. You'll probably not miss anything. Yeah. 
That's Hopefully. probably that's probably also true. Uh, and then CJ Nissen says, "Hey Brian and Drew, would you consider doing an occasional segment covering the history of various ink makers and pen makers? Five to ten minutes about." where and how they got started, what they're up to now, if still in operation, and what they're best known for. Interesting. So instead of like a pen spotlight, more of like a manufacturer spotlight or a brand spotlight. That is interesting. And when I first read this, I was just going to say, okay, well, we can just, I can just type in no. Um, (laughs) Because for, for like my immediate ideation was that a lot of these, especially ink brands, we uh-huh. don't have any transparency into them. We don't even have direct yeah. contacts to a lot of these ink brands. We do with some of them, mm. but we don't for many of them. Like I, I've never spoken to whoever's behind Diamine. We have our U.S. distributor, but there's some stuff out there about you know, the makers of Diamine. But what we could do if you know, if this is something that's legitimately interesting, like we did a factory tour for Montegrappa and Aurora, and mm. those videos. You know, yeah, they did okay, but it wasn't like a resounding, man, we need to travel around and do more of these because everybody loves this video. It was like kind of, eh. Yeah, but then now, the, Lamy, the Lamy tour we did Lamy was, was like amazing. one of our most successful videos. Now, Lamy, immensely popular. Montegrop and Aurora, not so popular. So maybe that's a factor. It's almost certainly a factor. What If, if that's something that y'all would really be curious about, we can do some some segments, some pre-recorded segments. If somebody, if we wanted to, you know, have an interview mm-hmm. via Zoom with somebody and chat yeah. with them about the history of their brand, we could definitely do that and then kind of just plug it into the PenCast, mm-hmm. uh, like we have done with like the team member interviews and stuff like that. We could, yeah. I will say, like, the research involved in doing this would be more intense. Well, that's why I, that's why I thought about interviewing instead of actually doing the research ourselves. Yeah, I'm all about not doing something. <laughs> I mean, I'm all for doing something. Oh, I know you are. Be like, you know, valuable and all, that, and people really like it and all that kind of stuff. You don't but need to be doing that, Brian. It's it's a lot. It's a lot of work yeah. to to like verify, especially brands that have been around a really long time. Yeah. Then it's like we, and if it's from other countries and stuff like that, we gotta we gotta. It's it's quite a bit of work to find reliable information. But, but if y'all wanted, I don't know. if y'all wanted me I'm to like to it. interview somebody from a brand or a company like let me know i can i can yeah. talk to some people and we can do that if it's something truly interesting uh and yeah so yeah let us That's know we can we can pursue that yeah the interview thing or honestly if just like a five minute summary of some things that we know like a not, five minutes so so you wouldn't be involved in this at all is that what you're saying five minutes i'm, I'm okay bit, i'm a bit optimistic about <laughs> this probably <laughs> five minutes what have i ever done in five minutes five minute overview of the history of a company are oh, you daft that does mate. sound a bit ambitious <laughs> I would have to like throw it into chat GPT and be like, simplify, 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 simplify. Or we just need to set a timer on your mic that shuts off after five minutes. Yeah. I would just keep talking. Yes. I would just, yeah. Anyway. Okay. Right. It's, it's a, it's an interesting thought. We, you got some wheels turning. We'll think about it. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so that's it for feedback for right now. Uh, let's talk about some new stuff, shall we? All right, Drew. Yes. I got a Visconti to talk about. You do not. The Medici <gasps> fountain pen. You do. Uh, Viola limited edition. So this is a Jonathan Brooks material, which looks awesome. Mm-hmm. It's a deep blue, slight hint leaning purple. Um, beautiful color. I mean, I love this resin. It looks really, really nice. And it's got the like fleur de lis um, ink window. It's a lily. A lily, sorry. Not fleur de lis. That's a I don't. Thing. I, yeah, I don't know that they look vastly different. They don't. It might be an orientation thing, or but yeah, it is. Okay. The, it is the Florentine lily. There you go. As I stand as it corrected. exists in the baptistry of Florence. Yes, that's what it says in the product that description. Sounds... That that stuck in my brain for whatever reason. Okay, baptistry that's more than it did in mine. Yeah. Um. But yeah. So very cool. So we had another Medici. Um. The Briarwood. Brown on Briarwood. There you go. So it's basically that pen, but... But not an acro silk. Correct. So this is a Brooks resin, so Brooks doesn't do acro silk. No. Whatever that is. I'm sure he he could if he put his mind to it. You know, Brooks is a pretty capable guy, so I'm sure that he could if he really wanted to. Um, So it's a U.S. exclusive, not a Goulet exclusive, a U.S. exclusive. There's only 88 of them, so it's pretty limited. Um, So if you are interested in that, it's 876, so it's an investment, but... It's a beautiful looking pen. Even if you're not interested in buying it, you should just go look at it because it looks really cool. And then another cool one, we got a new pen from Sailor, a Pro Gear Slim. So this is actually a pen and ink set it's called- Literally cool. 
It's literally cool. It's called First Snow. Uh, this is a limited edition set. Uh, 14 karat nib on this one, just like all the other Pro Gear Slims. Uh, it's a frosted white body, and then it's got applied snowflakes to it. So they're, I don't know exactly how they apply it, but it's like on top of it. I haven't really seen a lot of like imprinted designs on a sailor barrel. I think they've done it before in the past, but Probably. Not, not since we've had the brand. This is the first time and I've not, seen. And not in the US as far as I've seen. Okay, so they have a lot of different Pro Gear Slims, but this is a more unique looking one, and I think it looks really, really sharp. Um, they also did a snowflake engraving on the nib, which looks pretty tight. The nib looks really cool. And the finial looks pretty awesome too. It's got a snowflake on the finial that looks pretty great. So I don't know, this is a pretty pretty classy looking pen. I know we got some folks on the Goulet team that are like trying to snarf some of these before oh, we launch them. Yeah, like <laughs> I've, I've seen a lot of people like super, I, normally a pen yeah. launches, you might see one person show up and be like, oh yeah, can I get that one? But this one, I think that there's already like three or four people that are yeah. like stalking it like vultures. <laughs> yeah, on our team. Yeah. Um, so it also comes with a 20 mil bottle of uh, like an ice blue gray ink. I, I haven't swabbed the ink. I don't know what it looks yeah, like. I, I think don't think we're going to swab yeah, it. Yeah, I don't know which, if it's like a totally new color or if it's some other color that's been kind of packaging it, but it's anyway, the bottle, you know, goes with the pen and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's really nice looking. So if you're into the Pro Gear Slim, I definitely think this one's worth a look because it looks pretty cool. And then it's got the blue grip and the finials with the silver sparkles, you know, not that, not that unlike what we had for the uh, Northern Lights blue. It's kind of mm -hmm. like that kind of a vibe um, for those accent pieces. So, oh, sharp looking pen. So yeah, I'm digging these, all the blue, blue and white and mm, it's, it's hitting the right spots for me. Very blue. Yeah. Um, I'm going to handle the ink discussions yeah. today. So Waringal came out with a collection and then a single ink. So the collection that they released is a Peter Pan and Wendy collection. So you've got Captain Hook, you've got Peter Pan, you've got Tinkerbell, you've got Wendy Darling, you've got Tick Tock Croc, and then you've got some separate uh, ink swatch cards with Tinker, first name Tinker, last name Bell on them. So a little silhouette of her with her little fairy wings and you can fill it in and have a little have a little fairy swatch. <laughs> so that's cool. And the colors are rad. They're really cool. Y'all, Captain Hook is sweet. It is a nice deep red with a gold yeah, sheen. You're really into that Captain I Hook. I am into Captain Hook. Is it gonna is it gonna beat out Matador? Yes. Is your go-to red? Really? Yes, it is for real? Cause it is because I like red dragon. I yes. like the color of Red Dragon better than the color of Matador, but it okay. crusts on me, oh. and I ain't putting up with that. And Matador has always treated me treated me well. Red hmm. Dragon not so much. So I, I I I'm not riding the dragon anymore. I mean, but play with the dragon, you're gonna get burned. I, I did, I did. It's a crusty <laughs> dragon. So Captain Hook is looking right. So I'm excited about mm. that. Peter Pan looks good. Nice earthy green with some brown mm -hmm. undertones. Tinkerbell's also brown, but with sparkles, aka picks of dust. And then Wendy Darling is a Wendy, very yeah. light blue, almost illegible, but use a broad nib, you'll be all right. It's got a ton of shimmer in it. It's actually a little multi-tonal too. It feels mm -hmm. like if I didn't know any better, I'd be, think I was looking at a Sailor ink. And then TikTok Rock is a nice deep green. In addition to these, there is an ink called Frankenstein, which is obviously not a part of the Peter and Wendy collection. Mm -hmm. It is just Frankenstein. Not Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Waringal's Frankenstein. It is a cool looking ink. It is a purple ink with green shimmer and it just looks super Frankenstein-y or super Frankenstein's monstery. Mm -hmm. And I think this one's gonna sell really well, Brian. You think this will like, cause I I, th I feel like Waringal is a brand that not a lot of people have gotten to know that well. It's definitely a newer brand that we've picked up and it, you know, it doesn't have like necessarily like a go-to standout. I feel like most ink brands have like the go-to one that everybody talks about, you know, Organic Studio is Nitrogen. I think you I know, am a Jair cat. Bon is Emerald de Chavor. I am a cat. That's true. Yeah. That has been the most popular. That is that they've got that one. And yeah. Apart from that, I think it's been a little um, spotty. Do but you think uh, any of these is going to like trump? I am a cat for if the top I have anything to say goal? about it. Captain Hook is going to destroy the cat. Captain Hook is going to just put what make the cat walk the plank. You know, I would I would challenge that. <laughs> but when I think about like <laughs> when I think about diamond colors that have done really well, like Writer's Blood and Oxblood and stuff like that, these deep reds. They they vibe with folks. So also, like I just love I'm the fact curious. that I could write with a Disney villain. I know he's not Disney per se, but no. I'm going to be thinking about Hook. I'm going to think about Dustin Hoffman, and <laughs> yeah. yes, please. Yeah. 
So yeah. I'm super excited about that. It's also a good color. Very, very good it color. Is. They're all really Frankenstein yeah, they're, looks fantastic as well. So Waringal is doing a great job. And reception to Waringal Inks has been really, really positive. Yeah, so that's good. We're, we're super stoked to yeah, have those Maintenance available. on them doesn't seem really high. No. It seems like they behave pretty well. Solid so, inks. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so those are going to be $22 for the standard 30 mil bottles. Mm -hmm. And at $15 for a 15 mil bottle, so a dollar for a dollar, mm -hmm. is a new Colorverse ink celebrating the year of the dragon. It is Colorverse Blue Dragon. Mm -hmm. And it's one ink, but it's also four inks. Mm -hmm. So you have available to you the base Blue Dragon ink, which is blue with red sheen. Blue with red sheen. Mm -hmm. So you can just have that. But... If you want blue glistening blue dragon, you could have that same ink with blue shimmer. If you want gold glistening, you can have it with gold shimmer. If you want silver glistening, you could have it with silver shimmer. So four different inks, one regular, three glistening with three different glistening colors. What if you took and mixed all of those together? What would you call that? <laughs> Yikes. The blue, the, the blue dragon, gold, silver, whatever. Fancy I, dragon? Yeah. I don't know. Dragon. You can certainly do dragon that. Dragon parade, dragon attack. Dra wearing gold has glitter <laughs> potions. If you wanted to super shimmer your well, dragon, that's true. You, can, you can certainly do that. Wow. So I many think, options. I think the flame shimmer potion would mm. go appropriately well there. Huh, Hence what, the dra I see what you did there, dragoniousness. Girl. I see what you did. Yes. Yeah, so like I said, that is 20 bucks for cool. 20 mil. So a strong, strong list of new yeah. stuff we got this week. I'm two fun it. pens and two fun ink chunks. I'm into it. Yeah, very cool. All right, well, check out the new arrivals. Check out the coming soon products on Goulet Pens. You know what else I'll say, Brian? Stuff. Oh, I'm going to interrupt. What are you going to say? Because I brought this for you. Oh, what do we got here? Oh, oh yeah. We've got the um, sticker sheet. The Goulet Pencast sticker sheet, which... Y'all know what's up. I was telling you, they do, because here's the thing. We reordered these. Yeah. I so thought like, we, bought, batch. we bought several hundred of these because, yeah. you know, we wanted to make it worth our while. They're like, we need to buy more. Yeah. Why, why are y'all buy, bought them? Why are y'all buying these? <laughs> Can you tell me why you're buying these? Because they're cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are. Thank you so I much. I am blown away. But yeah. Brian, Brian didn't have this one mine. yet. So yeah. yeah, like they came in and I just, I don't know. I just didn't, it, I missed them. There you go. So he, he's got, he's got, got a he's got a bookshelf where he just like slaps a bunch of stickers in his office. Yep. So you can slap those on the bookshelf. Weird but I just thought that was crazy. It's like having a sticker of myself. <laughs> we, we were wondering like, is anybody going to buy these? I don't know. Does anybody want a sticker of Brian holding a log and an ax? Like with a Rubik's cube on my Ra belt? Ra Rachel was like, no one wants that. Like, yeah. <laughs> she's like, why do people want a sticker of Brian? Nobody's going to want that. Everybody votes with their dollars <laughs> and y'all y'all wanted them. Yes, so. thank you so much, y'all. That That is astounding. Yeah. We really, cool. really appreciate that's it. That's pretty cool. We're flattered. Yeah. So yeah, keep, I mean, I guess just keep letting us know what sticker ideas we should do because we can always do more. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Cool. So, All right. Q&A time. Yes. Shall we? All right. Brian. Drew. I'm ready for some I would questions. like for you to A, this cue from uh -huh. Athena writes. Okay. Athena says, I would like to see a video that addresses how pens might change with use. Do they adjust to the writer over time? Will mm. the nib wear out? Will parts eventually need to be replaced? Will they get better or worse over time? What can I expect as my pens age? Wow. There's a lot in this question. Okay. Um, one question, one thing that we've heard ever since we got into anything fountain pen related is kind of this romantic notion of like, oh, the pen adjusts to the individual writer and you don't even want to let somebody write their signature with it because it'll ruin the thing. I think that's a, a bit of bunk. Um, however, you know, I, the nib, like the pen adjusting to the writer, not, not really so much. I mean, these pens are made to last a long, long, long time. So if realistically they like adjusted or adapted to an individual in a relatively short period of time, then that would mean it's like breaking down or wearing out or something is happening that not really good. shouldn't be. Not intended. They should more or less stay pretty constant except over an extremely long period of time because they're durable and they're made to be lasting and they're all made with relatively hard materials, right? Um, so they're not going to like break in or wear away too quickly. Um, I'm struggling to think of pen parts that will kind of adapt or wear over time to like an individual user. I think that, you know, there's a clip. You, you got a thought. A clip? Like it, depending on how much it's used. A lot of people clip, yeah, clip yeah. them onto their jeans. So if the, yes. if the user is a very determined clipper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
That so, could happen. A clip could get yeah. a little bit more loose over time. So let me, let me nuance what I'm saying when I say like the individual user. I mean like on a, literally like a per person basis. So I think like there's categories of uses that you could have. So if you like, if you pocket carry your pens and you have it like, you know, on your jeans or whatever, the clip is going to take more wear and you might get some more scratches because you have keys in your pocket or whatever. Yeah. That's not so much like an individual thing. That's more of, of like a that's a, a, a habit or a, yeah. a use of that pen. You know what I mean? Um, so I think you know, just like if you have a really heavy hand, you're going to be more likely to kind of put pressure on that nib. The tip may wear away a little bit more if you're writing with more pressure and if you're using like more, you know, rough paper and stuff like that. Like there's certain like use kind of tendencies that you can have that might influence like the wear of certain parts and stuff like that. But I don't know that there's anything like that you as an individual need to be thinking about too deeply in terms of like wearing out a pen or anything. Um, because most of the wear I think is going to happen over a long period of time with use. And then you might have things like if you drop it or if, um, uh, if you, uh, spring the clip or something like that, or you spread the tines and misalign them, you know, there's like, kind of extreme use cases that can happen um, that's not necessarily just like normal wear and tear. Those kind of things can always happen. Um, and there's a lot of nuance to this because a lot of it comes down to what type of pen, what type of material. So I'll, I'll try to speak as, as much as I can about it. Um, some materials are going to show more signs of wear than others. I'm thinking about things like wood pens or if you have a pen that's got a matte finish to it, um, you know, wood pens especially if you're, if it's not like a heavily, heavily coated uh, wood, then touching that wood with your hands over time might absorb some of the hand oils, the, the wood might patina, you know, you can get ink on the wood, it can kind of stain it. So like there might be some things like that to keep into consideration. Um, other things like, you know, we've done matte finish pens out of like either acrylic or ebonite or something like that. And if you are using those all the time, the friction from your hands and the oils from your hands can actually kind of rub and polish up those matte finishes and you can end up with like sort of shinier spots. Um, so that, you know, may vary slightly on individual based on your hand positioning and stuff like that. Um, you know, with some care, you can, you know, rough kind of rough those back up a little bit sometimes depending on the pen to get that matte finish back. But that is something that can happen over time is the patina can change on your pens based on the material. I've also seen, depending on how the pen is made, this isn't supposed to happen, but it can happen that if you are a frequent poster of your fountain pens, yep. you could get a little bit of a line around the end if the cap is manufactured in such a way that it can mm -hmm. grind and uh, leave its impression on mm -hmm. the resin yeah. of the barrel. That is also potentially a thing. Um, so um, I got a couple different things. One of them is the nib tipping is going to have a lot of friction on it, right? So the tipping is what's being dragged across the page as you write. Now it's meant to last a really long time. It's made with, you know, platinum category metals and it's meant to be really, really hard wearing. Um, so, but I mean, eventually over years that can kind of get reshaped or worn down depending on how you're using it. Um, but oftentimes you can get them either retipped or kind of reshaped ground, um, by nib professionals. So that's something that if you're, you're a heavy, heavy user of that one particular pen for a long time, you may be, you know, years or decades down the road into like some kind of refurbishment type of thing with that nib. Um, that is not unusual. Um, most nib work can be adjusted and fixed by a pro, you know, just with normal use sometimes, you know, like I have a heavier hand. I have certain pens that I've had for a decade that just with a long time of writing heavier, I'm like, oh yeah, like my, like my, my blue Pilot Custom 74, it's got a medium nib on it. It writes a little bit broader than an out of the box medium nib because I've written with it with a heavier hand over a long period of time. Do you so think that has to that do down. with the tipping being reshaped or the no, that has to do with, moving? That has to do with me, you know, kind of flexing those tines yeah. with my heavy hand. But um, yeah, I don't think I've probably written with that one enough to actually like. No, I just didn't want anybody to think that's what you were talking about. I mean, theoretically that could happen though. You if you were writing I mean? on stone paper, maybe. I have ruined nibs with stone paper. I stone know. paper is very abrasive. Do not use pens. stone paper on your fountain pens. No, I can't Ever. recommend that. Can't recommend that. It's like writing on micro mesh, basically. Yes. It will really <laughs> do a number on your nibs. Um, so I wouldn't recommend that. Um, 
So filling mechanisms, I think those are things, the thing in your pens that, aside from the tip of the nib, those are the parts of your pens that probably see the most use and the most maybe potential for wear, uh, especially because you're not just filling it, but then a lot of times you're using it to clean. So if you have a vacuum filler, a piston filler, you know, you might be using that filling mechanism, you know, dozens of times per inking. Uh, and so there might be some maintenance and stuff that you have to deal with depending on the type of filling mechanism, especially when I think about like vintage pens that had sacks and, you know, some intricate parts sometimes in those filling mechanisms. Um, those would often be a frequently refurbed, you know, thing. Anybody who, who's into vintage pens pretty much knows like you, you're probably, if you pick up a, a pen at a whatever show or a craft fair, or whatever it is, like you're going to be resacking that pen pretty much immediately. Um, so Filling mechanisms, definitely something to pay attention to. Um, cartridge converter pens, the converters themselves are essentially meant to be replaceable. So it's not uncommon for converters to wear out. So that's, you know, it doesn't happen all that frequently. Like usually I'm gonna lose mine or something before I actually wear one out. Yeah, I don't know um, if I've ever worn happen. one out. I, I've, it can happen. There's been some user error on my end in mm. tr attempting to disassemble them. Oh. Especially Lamy converters that are not easy to disassemble. So I've definitely borked a couple of those. And I then done that I've well. given up on some converters after getting water behind the... But um, we know the trick for I that know. now, Drew. This was early on in my relationship mm, with fountain pens. Okay. And uh, honestly, it didn't hurt anything. So I don't know why I cared. <laughs> but it was aesthetically upsetting to me. So Well, there you go. I put it out into the land of wind and ghosts. Mm, there you go. Um, so yeah, basically anything where there's like friction happening. Uh, that's going to be a tendency for things to wear out. Um, so a little more care and maintenance is needed with those types of things. Um, piston seals on your, your filling mechanisms, especially pistons and, and vacuums, uh, vacuum fillers. Uh, so there may be some grease if you think about like a Twisby pen, you know, they come with grease. Not that you have to grease it that often, but it definitely is something that helps to keep the friction down over time. Um, and that's that's not a bad thing for a lot of pens, honestly, uh, is keeping them greased. Um, so uh, related to like, are pens gonna get better or worse over time? I had to think about this one a little bit because I, I would say like, generally speaking, the pens are gonna get worse over time because they're hard materials and there's with use, they kind of can only go downhill. It's kind of like driving a car. Like does any it's like does, 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 does like wine gets better with time? Yeah, I'm thinking about like what, what else gets better. But I can't think of like any like inorganic matter necessarily that gets better. Cast over, iron skillet with use over time. Yeah, but <laughs> it's not. Many. It's getting seasoned with organic matter. So I I don't know. I don't think it's that common for the, most things to actually get better over time. That said. I think there's like a break in period, maybe that can happen. Sort of like when you have a new car, or a new pair of shoes or something, you break it in, it actually gets more comfortable. We've potentially. We've had that question before and we've told people there you don't have to break in a nib. Yeah, I don't think you have to do anything to break in a nib. I think part of where I'm going with this, there's a break in period, not necessarily for the pen, but for you. Okay. That's to important to that keep pen, in mind. To get used to that pen. I agree with that. Yeah. Um, but you know, also I will say like to a degree, this is probably less of an issue with pens, but it's more of an issue with like with most new products in general, especially if there's like fine tolerances and friction involved. Sometimes when it's first manufactured, you know, you've got, you know, little bits of material left over from the manufacturing process or maybe some machining oils and stuff like that. That can happen sometimes like a little, you know, oils left over in the feed or something like that. You got to clean it, flush it a few times. And then it kind of like finds its groove. So I would say there's like a very short maybe break in period sometimes on these things. But honestly, most of the time, it's just you getting used to the pen. Um, so I will say the thing that I do think gets better with time is your own connection to the pen and your own appreciation for that pen. And understanding how it likes to be written with. Yeah, and you're finding good combinations of things to use with that pen. So from like a purely like physical scientific standpoint, I can't make a strong argument for pens getting better over time because they're hard materials that are going to, you know, eventually kind of wear uh, over time. But 
I think that the more you use them and appreciate them, you'll feel more of a connection to them. They'll be more sentimental. You'll appreciate them more. So you will actually, they will be more valuable to you over time. Um, and then basically what can you expect as your pens age? Um, yeah, I think that, uh, you can expect to have to do some regular kind of cleaning and maintenance. Yes, you want to clean out when there's, um, you know, color changes and stuff like that. But, you know, for example, if you have a piston pen and over time it feels like that piston's getting kind of harder and harder to work, it's not unusual. A little bit of grease on that piston can make it feel like brand new again. Um, so just kind of keeping up with some, some light regular maintenance can be really helpful, um, specifically around filling mechanisms because they see the most wear. Um, any part that has friction or pressure. So think about like the clip. You know, if the clip has got tension and it's being flexed, you can anticipate that over time that might, you know, be a potential to wear down. Anywhere where there's like threads on the pen, um, anywhere if you're, you know, posting a pen and it's just like pressure fitting on there, you know, part of the reason they put center bands on a lot of threaded caps is because it helps to reinforce because when you're capping a pen and those threads are going, it puts pressure, like outward pressure on the cap. And that center band helps to keep it from essentially splitting itself apart over time. Um, so it's not unusual for more of a tendency to that happen the more and more and more and you're capping and posting and you know it's just it's normal stuff just kind of wear and tear um nib alignment and maybe some nib wear we kind of talked about that a little bit if you're using a pen for a really long time and some people borrow it and you sort of lightly drop it on your desk every now and then you know it, you may need some nib adjustment nib alignment stuff that can happen over time um there could be some unique materials on some of your pens that have some special care needs like i mentioned wood um, maybe el el ebonite um you know making sure that ebonite's not kept in like bright sunshine because the uv can sort of break down the ebonite um, same thing with celluloid uh, there's some special considerations there. Sterling silver is going to tarnish, so you need to keep it polished, like that type of stuff. Um, depending on the material of the pen, there might be some special care needs that you have. Um, I would say any pen, you're going to get some kind of daily wear, just some like light scratches and, you know, some just, you know, just, just character that happens from you just living your life with your pen. Um, if that's something, you know, little scratches, dings, drops, that type of thing, hopefully nothing traumatic, but you know, you're going to get a little, little, little personality that happens on your pen as you use it. Um, and so if that's something you want to not have on your pen anymore, there's certain things, ways that you can polish it or have it refurbed and there's, uh, that kind of stuff. And then, um, last thing I'll kind of mention around that is, uh, um, you know, if you do find yourself in need of like a refurb or a repair, or there's something like that, you know, more long-term that like actually is inhibiting your in use and enjoyment of the pen and needs to be kind of fixed. Um, there are people that can fix pens. It's not like everywhere. They're very specialized, um, but it's always good to check with the manufacturer to see if they have any options for refurbing a pen. Um, or there's some specialists. Um, I know we've worked with uh, Aaron from Pentiques. Um, and recommended. There's some other people in the community too. A lot of them tend to, you know, sort of specialize maybe on particular types of pens that they know really well. So you might have to hunt around a little bit depending on the pen that you're, you're looking for. But um, there are people who are very passionate about fixing pens that uh, you can kind of keep in mind. So there you go. A bit of a general answer, but try to cover most of the bases. Not a deep dive, but a ankle deep swimming pool, kiddie pool. All right. <clears throat> I got a question from Caitlin Joe for you, Drew. Best pens to buy for using with shimmer inks. And we even got the little shimmer emojis. Oh, there. we do. Uh, I'd love to get a pen that I will use exclusively with shimmer inks, but I'm not sure which would be best. What do you think, Drew? Uh, Twisby. Twisby, demonstrators. Yeah. So a couple reasons why. A, it's good for a dedicated shimmer pen to be easily disassemblable, blah, 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 blah. Mm, That's a good point. Because you're going to need to clean it. Shimmer settles. Mm. And eventually, you're going to need to get in there with a feed brush and give that feed a good scrubbing. And just a pen that is easily disassemblable is a handy thing to have, which Twisby pens are that. The main reason, though, is because the way to enjoy your shimmer ink the most is by allowing it to i guess be moderated in such a way in your writing adventure so that it doesn't all come out at once so that it doesn't all clog and so that it lasts you your entire reservoir and your entire fill hmm. and the way to do that 
is by constant and consistent agitation. And the way to do that is by making sure you can see it at all times. So that's Having why you like poke you like this. As exactly. You get really agitated. So that's what I do. Brian just pokes me. <laughs> yep. But for you, since Brian unfortunately is not Santa Claus and he cannot traverse the entire planet in one evening, I recommend a clear pen because with a clear pen, you can see exactly how your shimmer is settling in your pen and within your feed. That is such a helpful thing. And once you write with a shimmer ink inside of a demonstrator, like an eco, if you decide to then put your shimmer in other pens, you have that mental image now of always picking up your pen and seeing a pile of shimmer just resting like a sandy ocean bed at the bottom of your liquid. And that will stay in your brain. And every time you pick up a pen, even if you don't see it, you'll have that mental image and you'll know there's a ton of crap in there that I need to agitate. So starting off with an Eco or something like a 580, something with a nice clear barrel, VAC 700 would be just fine as well. You're going to see it. And you're also going to see when it is appropriately agitated and nicely suspended in your ink so you can start writing. If you don't do that, A, you're going to just exhaust all of your shimmer right from the get-go, or B, you could run the risk of clogging a little bit more easy because all of that shimmer is going to try to come all out at once. Mm -hmm. So constant agitation, write a couple words, just twist, spin, rotate, write a couple more words, spin, twist, rotate. It's kind of a pain. And you don't have to do it. You certainly can just do it the way you wanted to do it and maybe clean it a couple more times, maybe get three quarters of the way through your fill and not really have any shimmer left. You can go ahead and do that if you want to. Me, I like an even distribution and a clear pen helps with that. So that's my suggestion at Twisby because A, it can be user serviced and B, because it's clear and it can remind you to agitate while you are not being agitated and enjoying your writing experience. Because I don't want you to be agitated. I just want you to agitate mm. your pen. I just prefer to write really frantically. That way my pen is naturally just agitated. There you go. I saw- It makes my handwriting unreadable, but the I shimmer looks great. I follow a lot of like 90s, I don't follow, but my algorithm on Instagram shows me a lot of 90s toys because really? I'm, I'm a sucker for that, obviously. That's shocking. I know. <laughs> it showed me the other day these, these old ballpoint pens that had a rotating kind of arm in them that you turn on, and the pen itself would be like, start kind of spinning because it had a weight in the back on an arm Interesting. and it would make it would like make your writing squiggly on purpose was like the point to make it squiggly or circly or something i seem, but to, I seem to recall i this. had one yeah, yeah i definitely had one wow yeah so that's amazing that that's not still popular not with... a gimmick at all <laughs> i think it'd be great in a fountain pen no, oh my gosh. nothing could go wrong wow that would yeah. be uh that would be interesting yeah so interesting. Yep. That's okay. my, that's my little feedback. What do you think, Brian? Uh, the only thing I have to add to that, I agree. I think Twizbees are great for that. I've, I've had experience. I've, I've, I'm, I've mentioned before on the Pingas when I had my, uh, the eco first came out, I inked up, I think one of my first ecos that I ever got, this was like eight years ago or something. Uh, I inked it up with Emerald of Shavor, which mm -hmm. is a shimmering ink. Granted, it's not like the heaviest shimmer, but it's, it's, it's definitely a shimmering ink. Uh, and I think I had it in that pen for eight months and it just sat there. And then I picked it back up and it just wrote immediately, like didn't skip a beat. So to me, I love the eco. It's very, you know, that especially that round clear barrel makes it really easy to see the shimmer. Like and those you seal really well. I did not mention that, but to Brian's they do point, seal well. yeah. if you do leave it alone. In particular, for... so the thing that, that I didn't, I don't think you mentioned like the nib selection as well. So well, like, nib doesn't really matter. Well, I like to use broad nibs because it it puts down more and I think it oh, okay, shows yeah. the shimmer more. From a visual standpoint, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's not so much like it doesn't affect like whatever drying out or like any of that kind of stuff. But in terms of showing off the shimmer more on the page, uh, I would say broads and flex nibs. Yeah. Well, cause flex nibs especially because it's just dumping ink on the page. Um, that obviously is not in a Twisby. There's other, you know, flex pens that you can get. Um, and it does get interesting when you get into flex with shimmer because now you're like really messing with the ink flow, you know, variables. Um, but if you're determined and you're patient, you can get some pretty cool stuff to come out of those. Um, so those I have a good time. But for me, like a, basically a broad Twisby Eco is a really good like default thing to uh, use my shimmer inks in. So there you go. Do you want to know how much, um, how many drops of uh, wearing gold shimmer potion Jenea likes to put in her inks? Oh, I bet it's a lot. 
you think it's the recommended amount? Oh, no way. It's got to okay. be more. Stay tuned to the Meet Jenea <laughs> section. <laughs> you can find out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> awesome. All right. Okay, here we go. We're going to move on to uh, mm. Celine. Say Celine. 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 Um, you've done a lot of lists about the practical aspects of pens, mm-hmm. but what are your top three or five sentimental pens, mm. the ones you keep around because of connections to a good memory or experience, regardless of design or performance. Do we have to have ones that are disregarding designer performance? Yeah, I thought, I thought about that because I definitely have some that I like, even though they don't write particularly well, yeah. but they're not like super sentimental to me. I have more sentimental pens. So I went that route. I just went with my most Pure sentimental sentiment. pens. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I went. I went with sentimental as well, but I didn't specifically go out of my way to choose pens that don't perform well. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, 99% of my pens perform just fine. Yeah, I have a bunch that don't, but you know, well, you have, I keep everything. Yes. So. <laughs> I'm way less selective about my collection than yours. You also have some um, weird pens that- I do, like, I like weird stuff. You don't even know the brands of some of them. This is true. Um, okay, so do should I start? Do yes, of course. Ones? Okay, well, you said pick three or five, so I went with four because that's what I do. I did five. You did five? I did. Drew has more I than did. me? Wow. Let's see who takes the long in discussing it. Uh, yeah. I. <clears throat> hey, I feel like that was a dig, but I don't know. People watch it, so I, I'll take that as a whatever. Um, <laughs> I have to have a little disclaimer here. This is, this is not a definitive, like, my top three, four, uh, because I just have way too many that are, like, kind of on a similar plane. I have a lot of exclusives that we've done that we've kind of had a hand in designing. I have a lot that were gifts that were given to me for various reasons. So I have I have too many sentimental things where I'm not trying to, like, rank different sentiment and, like, oh, I like this person better, so this gift means more. So I just went with three that have kind of interesting stories and are meaningful. So if if we've gotten asked this question before, we generally couldn't remember if we have. I think we have maybe in a different way. Yeah. But if we happen to get asked it again and I have different answers, don't be like, oh, right. I hope right. next time you right, add in the fountain pen that I gave you because you've just been completely ignoring that. Yeah, well, I don't really care about that as much. Wow. So, I haven't um, even given him a fountain pen and he said that just right yeah, off the cup. Exactly. It's because wow. you haven't given me anything. So, you know. Um, anyway. <laughs> uh, so here's my, t- technically, I have, a, I have a top three, but I have one that's not a fountain pen. So it's like a, a bit of a caveat. I'll explain it mm. in, in a second. Okay. Um, first one I have is my Blue Pilot Custom 74. Of course. It was my first gold nib pen. It is a blue pen. It was kind of just became known for this pen and, and being a fanboy of this for a long time. I still write with it. It's inked up right now with guess what? Konpeki, Ayo. shocker. Um, I still love it. I still write with it. It's been, when did I get that pen? 13 years ago and I'm still enjoying it. So I do like that one. And it was very important to my story of using fountain pens as well as, you know, kind of a, a milestone in our company's history as well. Another one, this is a, a little more of like a specific personal thing. It's my um, Sailor 1911 King of Pens, Asian Way. So this is not a pen that to my understanding was available in the US. I bought this in Japan. So it was meaningful because that was the first trip I'd ever been to Japan. Uh, It was meaningful because we did not carry Sailor at the time, but I bought it because it was a beautiful pen and I just felt like I needed to have it and have knowledge of it. Um, And then eventually when we were able to carry Sailor again, it became that much more meaningful to me. Uh, And it's got a broad nib with that two tone, it's a it's a gorgeous pen. So I just love the way it looks. And it's the only pen that I've ever bought not in my own language. So I had to use Google Translate on my phone and go back and forth on the phone to transact this pen in Japan. And I was flying solo on my own. I was just walking down the Ginza in Tokyo and found this pen at like an event. I think it was at Marzan. I think it's like one of the books to one of the big bookstores. I think that's the name of the store. Marzen. Um, Marzen. There you go. So I think it was there. They were having like an event there. Um, and so I found that there and I was like, that, that's the ticket. I'm going to get that. So meaningful in multiple ways. And I have good memories tied with that trip um, there. Um, so both of those pens are good pens. So I didn't want to like exclude them because, you know, they're, they're good pens. The next one I have is not a good pen. Please explain this to me. So there's a story behind this one. I think this pen is hideous. It is. It's a Noodler's Nib Creeper. Uh, it is not a flex nib. So this is the 
OG Nib Creeper. So this is before like Nathan, OG that smells like OG. These this was like almost like a prototype kind of Nib Creeper. This pen didn't really exist. Um, Nathan had only been making Noodler's ink up to that point, and he started making this pen. At the time, we did not sell pens at Goulet Pens. We only sold ink and paper. This is before your time, Drew. Mm -hmm. So Rachel and I were, you know, ordering our Noodler's Ink and um, the same distributor that um, we bought Platinum and, you know, a couple other things from. Um, and our distributor threw this pen in with our shipment of ink. And you know, I, On purpose? Yes. As a gift? Yeah, okay. because at the time, as crazy as this sounds, I didn't know a lot about pens and I was kind of intimidated by it. And I was like, maybe I'll just be like the, the ink and paper guy and I'll just go all in on ink and paper and just not really focus on pens, um, which seems kind of ridiculous now because it's like, obviously pens is a very important part to the whole equation. One might say. Um, but it was, it was, it was really difficult to kind of break in. You didn't want to overreach. Pen thing. Yeah. And I was very humbled by yes. how much there was to learn. And how many people out there knew so much. Yeah. And we were just, we were operating out of our garage. What did we know? You know, so we were trying to focus on ink and paper. We had been doing the blog and started the YouTube channel, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I was really intimidated to actually review pens and pretend that I knew anything about pens. Um, but it was through the encouragement of our distributor. He threw this pen in there and was like, I really think you guys should sell pens. Like, duh. I really think you guys could, that, that could exact do pens. Pen? This was the pen. Huh. So if it, so it's, it's kind of two part. It's sentimental because... That distributor, is no, he's, he's passed away, and we had a good relationship with him, and it was kind of pivotal at that time in our business. He really, he was one who saw potential in us as a just, we were 25-year-olds running a business out of our dining room. Like, who who would really see that? You know, and we had to claw our way into legitimacy in this industry, um, you know, one brand at a time, one product at a time. Um, and a lot and of no's was, that have turned to yeses. Oh, a lot of no's. And, you know, rightfully so. We were a total risk. But, you know, he was one who kind of believed in what we were trying to do. And so um, it's meaningful in that way. But then also like the pen, I mean, the yellow, I don't like this color at all. But I think it's meaningful to me because it helped me, like just having this pen in my hand, it helped me to see the potential of like, yeah, okay. I can see, even though like this pen is not winning me over because of its beauty. <laughs> well, it's very humble. Um, it probably helped yeah. you to understand that pens don't need to be intimidating. Well, and that's just it. Yeah. It was a, it was what, I think $12 at the time or something like that. And I was like, okay, this feels kind of attainable, you know? And then they started doing the flex nibs and it was kind of new. And I was like, well, nobody really knows anything about this. So I feel like I can talk about it. And it, and it really was kind of like the foot in the door for us selling pens at Goulet Pens. So it's very significant in that way. I, if I had heard that story, I think I had forgotten. It's been a while. Yeah. I haven't okay. told it all that much recently. You know what? But that, that yellow pen has so some renewed significance. I think this one probably fits the bill very much to this question. Absolutely. Because it's like, I mean, it, it writes fine. Like it's it's a it's a decent pen actually. Um, but I I don't like thin pens and I don't like bright yellow. But anyway, I saw that potential and that was uh, that was cool. Uh, and then the last one I have, I don't actually physically have it here because I think I have it at home. I thought I had it in the office. Um, uh, it's my first pen that I ever turned out of wood. Um, again, that was another significant one for me. This is before fountain pens were even something I really, honestly even really knew anything about. Um, but I was just, I wanted to work with my hands so bad. I had recently graduated college. I didn't end up going into, my degree was in property management. I didn't end up lasting in real estate. So I was really trying to find myself. I was power washing houses and cleaning carpets with my dad. You know, I wanted to do woodworking. I was, I was a bit of a, a I was a, I was wandering. I was searching at that time. And searching for authority, right? Yes. I needed some authority in my life. No, not at all. Um, but no, it was, it was, I bought a small pen lathe. I, Rachel, for whatever reason, was supportive in me getting a pen lathe and putting it on our covered balcony in our apartment. Um, I probably broke a few codes violations by draping extension cords out the window and running lights and everything out there. Uh, but it was like turning that first pen out of wood. I had never turned anything. I had no experience doing any of this, but I just kind of bought it a bit of on a whim because I like felt like I could make something. And then I made that first pen and I was like, oh, this is cool. 
And that that's honestly what got the ball rolling into me making pens and selling them as corporate gifts, which then turned this into a business, which then obviously led us on the path of Goulet pens. Was it so, loud? The lathe is very quiet. Oh, okay. No, especially if, like small stuff like that. Um, Cause it's, the motor's really quiet while it spins and like it makes a little bit of noise as you're like kind of knocking the wood down, but it's, it's relatively quiet. It's about as loud as like sanding something. Oh. So it's pretty quiet. Now, when I ran the table saw on the router, that was really loud and obnoxious. At your apartment? Yep. Oh, I had a whole workshop out there. It was it was quite obnoxious. I put up plastic sheathing, so you really, it was on the second floor. So I pulled up plastic sheathing, so you really couldn't, couldn't see what I had up there. <laughs> Did we, your neighbor we say apartment. anything? My neighbors never complained, but I was always trying to be very conscious. I, like, I never did it at night. I was always doing it like during the day when it maybe wouldn't be as disruptive. And I was really conscious of how loud the big tools were. So I really, that's why I started making pens because like I need something quiet enough to where we won't like disturb our neighbors and get kicked out. But then we moved into a rental house and we could do it whatever we want. So anyway, so that's a little piece of my story is that that wood pen. And it's not pretty and it looks like garbage because I didn't know what I was doing, but it, I, I pressed it together and it was a wood pen. And I was like, this is cool. I want to do more of this. And here we are. Well, well so it was, I didn't. I don't have my Goulet rollerball on my list, but that's obviously something that's sentimental to yeah, me. Yeah, I, I would exactly. definitely never, never get rid of that. Also, yeah, it has my name one. on it, so no one would want it anyway. There you go. Exactly. I bet people would want that, actually. A pen made by me with your name on it? I guarantee you we would get some takers on that. Okay, well. People buy stickers with our nonsense on it, so. That's. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm just saying. True. That's anyway. true. So those are my three fountain pens, four pens overall. Nice. There you go. Fitting well within the parameters of the question. Yeah, absolutely. I'm very proud of that. Yeah, not bad. And you're not going to beat me. <clears throat> no, I'm not. Not, you go. not going to try. <laughs> okay. So this one y'all might be familiar with. Uh, this one is my newest pen acquisition. This one was a gift uh, from mm. a friend. He commissioned it through Garage Fountain Pen. Do not email Garage Fountain Pen. <laughs> He's busy and not bored enough to take on any new work, I don't think. I don't know, maybe. Ignore him. <laughs> but this pen was made for me by him, and it was, it is, it's brown. It's crazy looking. It's got some rotten chunks, and it's the only one, and it was for me. And it's a Kakuno. It's an Urushi Kakuno. <laughs> and there is no way I would ever part with this because, you know, it's it was incredibly kind and now is incredibly unique as well, so... Uh, there's just, there's no words for this. It's, it's amazing and wonderful and super brown and crazy. And I love it. <laughs> it is pretty wild. Like me. Um, and then there is this one, which is quite different, but this is a Montegrappa, um, Elvis pen. Oh. They made three Elvis pens. They made an army pen. They made this one, the uh, Vegas version. And then they made like a light blue, uh, like a blue Hawaii one, maybe. But this is the crazy, gaudy Vegas one with the TCB lightning bolt, which I just live by. Um, Archer hates it when I say TCB. He's like, stop saying that. Really? Yeah, he just doesn't. I'm like, it means taking care of business. He's like, just, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't like it. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, well, I'm going to say that more. Um, it has Elvis on the nib. And uh, this was given to me uh, by the company um, at five years. So that was a big deal. I was the first employee to hit five years, and this definitely – uh, was not a thing that could happen again. Um, so I was fortunate enough to- I specifically to, told you, I was like, this is not setting a precedent. No. <laughs> this was a one-time kind we of special thing. We didn't know what was going to happen. We're like, yeah. hey, we hit, somebody here hit five years, you know. Um, <laughs> but no, they got a crazy good deal on it. Um, so I would absolutely never, ever, ever part with that. That is a tremendously beautiful pen and uh, very, very sentimental to me. Having, you know, in five years now, it seems like, the five-year-old version of the Goulet Pen Company is like a completely different. different company. Like yeah, it, was... it feels like we've worked for like four different companies since the beginning. It really. does kind of feel like that. So um, it just reminds me of my journey here and um, the Have kindness you... of my employers. Well, thank you. Mm. Have you ever dressed up as Elvis for Halloween? I'm not a huge Elvis fan, honestly. I, I'm a huge fan. It's just the TCB. I thing? love the TCB. Okay. I love Tank Care Business, baby. You know, I just love that mentality. I love the TCB. I love that he had a ring. I love that he had all of his Memphis Mafia wearing these things. I love that he had it on the tail of his private jets. Yes. Oh, I, I love just, the drunk histories. Of yeah, Elvis. I just love it's it. I love great. the whole mentality of it, and yeah. it just makes me happy. Now, if you gave me a choice between Elvis versus the Beatles, I would pick Elvis every time. But I can't really say oh, I'm an Elvis alone, fan, um, hmm. but uh, I am a fan of TCB. Well, I'll, uh, I'll play the seed. I feel like you could pull off yeah. an Elvis like impersonation. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Just teed that one right up for you. Thank I? you, baby. Yeah. Um, 
And then you remember that from the office? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's so stupid. Uh, um, and then this was another gift from a friend. This is a Pilot, uh, more or less a Pilot Custom 74, but it is an Arushi pen. And I don't know if it is one of a kind, but mm. it is pretty darn close to one of a kind. I've never seen another one out there. It is a forest green Urushi, and I don't recall the specific style, but it's that raised bumpy style that they then sand down to reveal different colors within the textured Urushi so that it ends up being smooth. But uh, I know that this is a very rare pen and it was given to me by a very dear friend. So I would absolutely never ever part with this. I wouldn't part with any of my gift pens, but um, that one specifically I know was important to this individual and I really appreciate um, him trusting me with this. And then um, this pen is a Pilot Custom 912, probably my favorite pen because I got it, I loved it. I loved it so much. I had the uh, feed replaced. So this, first of all, is a Custom 912. The nib was from, you know, years ago uh, when John Modishaw was um, grinding nibs, he created this one as a, or Gina might have done, I don't know, um, created this one as a, an extra, extra fine added flex. So I think it's a Spencerian grind. So it's very, mm. very bouncy. That sounds terrible. And um, yeah, you would hate it. <laughs> uh, you need a light hand for this one. Yeah. But I love it. It quickly became my favorite pen. It was a little inconsistent though. So I did replace the feed with an aftermarket feed from mm. Flexible Nib Factory. It's a two channel ebonite feed fit mm. for the 912. It wrote incredibly well. Mm. And then after that, I had it sent to uh, DeWalker over at District Urushi to have it covered in Urushi and Rodden. So the nib is customized, the feed is aftermarket, and the pen itself it has been customized too. So it is very much my pen. It feels like it just is connected to me in a lot mm. of ways. So it's very much the most kind of intimately attached pen I have. So I would mm. never, never uh, get rid of that one. And then finally, this was a, uh, this is my oldest pen. It is a uh, Waterman from like 1910. Wow. And it has been restored. It is an incredible writer. And this was given to me by my friend Craig. And uh, he is just kind of a human being that is ridiculously generous. And um, this just reminds me of just how incredibly kind all the like a lot of the different people in the fountain pen industry or the fountain pen community have been to me i mean i have a lot of i'm lucky enough to have a lot of examples of that mm -hmm. but this one is right up there he is a huge waterman collector and um he even included the box and the instructions the original instructions from wow. 1910 which just blows Holy my God. mind um from a historical standpoint the significance of this pen and it is very much a please write with this pen and I wow. need to write with it more because it writes amazingly well mm. and um, there's no reason not to enjoy it because it is phenomenal. But uh, I still, it's hard because it's just so old. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, those are uh, those are my tops. It's pretty cool. I feel like you got a bougier collection than I do here. Well, I didn't, these, know, I didn't know what you were going to pick when I put these together. I'm of like, man, these, I kind do. Of show me up yeah. a little bit here. Well, these are these are really cool. They're yeah, really I mean they're they're more unique. So I think that yeah, actually three of uh, three of them are Arushi. So, but these are the only three Arushi pens I have. So. <laughs> but they obviously mean a lot. So that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So awesome. That's for me. Cool. Um, but another, uh, these have all been gifts. I think that I would be glad to give away. Some of mine. Sometimes I've I've been gifted a pen and I've mm. turned around and just given away one that I've paid for just because I feel like I'd like to pay that forward. Yeah. That's so cool. even if a pen, well, like my, I think about my Lamy two thousand, which was my first uh, gold nib pen, or even um, my second gold nib pen, which is a platinum modern Machie. Mm. Um, I did give that one away, yeah. and I don't have a problem giving away pens that I've paid for. Mm. Like I kind of like it. Like even if they're sentimental to me. Right. Okay. Like I because I've been given pens that have been sentimental to others and. Mm. I think I would enjoy the opportunity to give away something that is sentimental to me as long as I was the one that paid for it. Right, okay. Gifts so off, off limits. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to like give something away that is sentimental. You know, like yeah. it, was mean it was a meaningful gift to you. If you give it away, you destroy it that away. that intent. Or it continues the story. You know what I mean? Like I've... I've I guess, yeah. That, no, you've, you've got a point. You've got a point. If, if that person's intent was to kind of... Uh, proliferate the joy of writing, yeah. then yes. If that person's intent was to was say, like, 
a, I, a deeply personalized yes, thing. Then, yeah. then no. Yeah, that's um, fair. But you bring up a good point. That's fair. Yeah, I think the intent, you know, maybe the intent matters. Kind of folds into it. Yeah. yeah, very cool. Great question. Thanks. I'm glad we got to go down memory lane a little bit there. Um, and curious if y'all have any like personal sentimental pens too. Um, I know a big thing in the pen community is like pens either given or passed down or something like that, like within family or from like a significant friend, significant other. That's a really big thing. So I'm curious if y'all have any um, pens like that that are really meaningful to you. Um, getting to hear some of the stories would be pretty cool. So feel free to post those in the comments. All right, Drew, I have a question for you from Drinkwater. Food A or Flex Nib for drawing? That's a fun question. Uh, I am not an artist. I am not a sketcher. I like to what, doodle. What, and is, I, what is a food day, just so for people that don't know? A food day. You know, don't ask Drew and Brian from the episode entitled, What's a food day? Because they didn't know. Um, <laughs> I thought it was one that went down. You said it was one that went up. You were correct. It is a nib that is upturned so that you can write reverse usually and have a little thin line, or you can write with that big flat part and have a big fat line. Um, so, and a flex obviously is something that provides you with a different uh, writing width Time depending on pressure. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, I have l enjoyed drawing with both of them. Mm. I will say some pros and some cons for each. Overall, I like drawing with a Fude nib better. Mm. It is more consistent in its line, you know, either big fat small, tiny, um, and it is more, uh, it takes turns better. So with a flex nib, mm -hmm. you have to write in one direction. You have to pull, basically pull down on the nib. With a food nib, you can kind of move that in any direction. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, you know, if you, if it's oriented kind of vertically, you'll get a little bit different line than going that way because the tipping material isn't going to be a perfect square, but more or less you can shift it around and you'll get a big line versus flipping it over and getting a small line. Yeah. So it is more consistent. You're not having to flex anything or move anything. So over time, you're not going to have the same sort of maintenance slash writing considerations that you're going to need to make with a flex pen. You're not going to have as many flow issues. However, there aren't any nibs with a stock Fude that we currently sell. I know you can get some, you know, from mm. Jin Hao on Amazon and things like that. Yeah. And we have dip pens from Sailor that have Fude nibs on them, but those are dip pens. So mm -hmm. when you, when I'm extolling the virtues of Fude in terms of consistency and reliability, that kind of goes out the window when you're having to dip. Yeah. So if you can get a fountain pen with a Fude nib, I would say that that is the way to go. It's mm. consistent, reliable. You don't need to have a whole lot of considerations in how you write, which if you're drawing, you're, you're thinking about getting something on paper. You're not really, personally, I don't want to have to make a lot of considerations on the direction I'm taking. With flex, you have to pretty much be pulling down, opening up those tines. And that means, you know, if you wanted to make a circle using a flex nib, you'd need to kind of go around and then up or turn the paper. So you'd have to go down again. That That's going to be a little bit more difficult. Mm. If you'd like to you know, create a you know line drawing using a thin stroke and then kind of outline it to give it a cool outline or a stamp look, it's it's you're gonna have to move your hand around or move your paper around more with the flex. And maybe that's totally fine with you. I think that moving paper, shifting that around is a pretty common practice for you know sketch artists and things like that. Yeah. So it's not like that's the you know big problem. But if you're urban sketching or something like that and you have your notebook and you don't want to be twisting and turning. Yeah, I find Fude nibs to be a little bit more versatile in that regard. Um, but with a flex nib, you can already get those on several different fountain pens. Mm -hmm. So your accessibility there skyrockets. Yeah. So uh, overall, if you can get a flex nib, a fountain pen with a Fude nib, I think that would mm -hmm. suit me better uh, because that's just what I want. I don't want to have to worry about a bunch of stuff. I want to worry about my result on the paper. But there are way more flex nibs out there with uh, food a you'd need to either get it customized or you'd need to find uh Jin Hao or something I yeah, that's really... what i was going to ask is like you know because I've, I've definitely run into people at like pen shows and stuff like that that have food days but i feel like a lot of them are either kind of like you mentioned like Jin Hao has some that you can get like on amazon or whatever wherever, wherever it is that, that they happen to be um but is it like people getting them customized by a nib 
workers and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And but you have to kind of like know that that's what you want. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. Yep. Yeah. So, but by all means, if like try the Sailor Hokuro mm -hmm. dip pen because those mm -hmm. are affordable and they have fudai nibs on them. So yeah. just in order to test them to see if that is something that would be conducive to your drawing style, that's an easy way to get started and they're great yeah. fun. So I would say start with that. And then if you're like, absolutely, I love this style, consider getting one customized and bent yeah. radically on purpose and by a professional. What type of pen do you think would be best to may, be made into a fude nib? That's a good question because th like there are some nibs that extend past the front of the feed more so than others. Yeah. Some of them, there's just not a lot of room. Like we right. were looking at, um, I don't have it with me, but I, I, if I remember correctly, we were looking at my Scribo pen earlier today. Mm -hmm. That's got a very long nib, very narrow, mm -hmm. very long. I think that that has a pretty considerable extension of the mm. nib past the feed. So something like that I think would be really good. Yeah. But also the <clears throat> more you have to travel, no, I guess if it works normally, it shouldn't change it because you're not extending it in any way. Yeah, so something like that. I would think yeah. that you just, you can't pick something that doesn't mm. go far enough past the- uh, Yeah, and I'm trying to think like- Maybe that doesn't matter. Now that I'm thinking about it, that yeah. might not matter at all because you're not going to, the feed's still not gonna touch the paper. So it doesn't really matter. I don't know, man. I really don't. Yeah, I guess. The, I mean, if I'm like, I'm like contradicting myself, and no, I'm I mean, yeah, we, I've never had a pen customized into a food day, so I, I'm, I'm genuinely just like kind of curious. I'm like, I haven't really thought about that before. This actually. is this is this is. I don't know what I'm talking about about regarding the food day part two and the pen cast. Yeah, but uh, well, so what I would say is probably if you, you know, to summarize what I'm what I'm gaining from your talking, Drew. Um, if you have never tried one and are curious, the Sailor, Sailor Hokuro is a great way to try it, especially without a huge investment. And if you really like that and want that in a fountain pen, reach out to your Nibmeister of choice and then ask them, what's a good pen that will be, that is that is like well made into a food day. Mm -hmm. And if they have done it before, they will probably be able to tell you like, oh, I've done it on xyz pens and it tends to work pretty well so you know rather than taking because i would think like modifying a nib that much it's going to be less about like taking a pen you like and making it into a food it's more like start with the nib and what's going to get you that output and then kind of let that guide which pen choice you make and, yeah. and a nib professional is going to have that perspective i would think we talked about trying to get those janel food days and Something happened, like we tried and then they didn't know what we were talking about or something. There's a big language barrier. Yeah, in between we had some difficulty with that. Yeah, it's, it's. I don't know that it's the kind of thing that they like make regularly. No, and it's, it wasn't, kind of thing. yeah, and, and it, it it's not a straightforward process. Yeah, we could probably we can, figure out how to do it, but it would take some time. And We have ordered things in quantity like that that are difficult to communicate and we've gotten the wrong thing on numerous occasions. And we have to buy in pretty large quantities. So it was the kind of thing like, okay, well, if it's kind of speculative anyway, and we're going to have to commit to huge quantities, and we don't feel super confident we're going to actually get the thing we think we're ordering, maybe we'll sit on They might just send us fountain pen food. <laughs> I could. I could. Like, that's not what we want. It's, yeah. I mean, cool. Yeah. But, yeah. That's, that's my yeah. Uh, two cents. Yeah. And hey, just like everything else that we always answer on here, if you happen to know more about food yes. items or have had one customized and have anything to lend, please let us know in the comments so other people can benefit, but also so that we can learn too. Yeah. Because we don't know everything. You. But we know enough to be competent enough we to at least take enough. the question. Yes, we know enough to know how little we know. Yes. Um, all right. We got one more question, Drew. Yes, we do. And this is from Open Side Morpheus. Hmm. That, well, that, took, okay. that didn't take as long as I thought it would to okay. figure that out. Um, all right. Will the market in vintage pens ever be robust enough for a retailer like Goulet Pens to get involved? Mm. Is, the, is the vintage robust. pen market growing? Um, I mean, I guess technically. Because I guess every year the, new, vint new pens become vintage. Yes. And every year old pens are getting thrown out and broken and stuff like that too. Mm -hmm. My guess is that more pens are being made than are being destroyed, but I don't know. Um, what, what, is, what is vintage in terms of fountain pens? Cause like cars, it's like 20 years, right? Yeah, I think so. 25 years, I think. 
Um, I think to get an antique plate, at least in Virginia, I think it's 25 25 years old. okay. Yeah. Well. Um, which is funny because I have a truck that is a 2002. I have a 2002 F-250. That, that's getting, close. getting close. Yeah. I'm like, and I don't drive it that much. Maybe I should get antique plates for it. Farm use. That would be pretty wild. <laughs> it's kind of. Um, I take it to the dump. I take it to the you know, gas station and use it around property. Anyway, um, vintage pens. That's a great question. I, we are, you know, coming right off the food day question, we are really on the brink of things that we don't actually know that much about here. So take everything I say with like handfuls of salt. Um, so I, I could be mistaken, but I don't know that there is like one agreed upon age that makes a pen vintage. Um, I don't know. I think, you know, 20 to 25 years is probably a good gauge, you know, just like you have with cars and, you know, like, I don't know, what is vintage clothing? Is there like an age for that? Or like, I don't know, when I hear things like Blink-182 on the classic rock station, I'm like, is it though? You know, it's like, I guess it has been kind of a while. I don't know. And Linkin Park on classic rock, I'm no. like, yeah, oh yeah. Because like some of these bands have been around for like 30, 40 years. Okay. So I'm like, okay. I guess 25, okay. 25 makes sense. So I don't know. Let's let's peg it at 25. It's what, it's 2024 right now. Holy crap. So uh, 1999 in previous would be, I mean, that was before our time in the pen world. That sounds vintage. But, I mean, yeah. So anything from the previous millennium. Uh, I feel like if, if, if someone, if 99 rolls around and I saw like a, Austin 316 t-shirt and someone listed it as vintage and be like, yeah, I would believe that. Yeah. Like that feels very 99 to me. Yeah. Do you smell what the rock is cooking? Yeah. Like I would say, yeah, that feels vintage. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, He's describing my entire wardrobe in 1999, by the way. <laughs> well, you know, you had a look. Yeah. Um, you don't want to know what my wardrobe was in 1999. What Swishy was pants. 19, what was 1999? We old, old, in, old, old Navy fleece vest. I rocked a lot of Old Navy. My sister worked at American Eagle, so mm -hmm. I did have some American Eagle items only because she got. You were a not good opposed discount. to bright colors back then, like I was experimenting. Yeah, yeah. I feel like you had an orange something. Probably. Yeah. I remember I had like bright red track pants. Maybe that's what. Yeah. And it was a big thing to have. Like, I remember you being very bright, like a tank top shirt with a fleece vest with like track pants. Mm-hmm. That was a look. That was a look. Like bleach blonde tips. Yeah. Yeah. And. Very Backstreet Boys. Yeah, that was I'm, very I'm wearing time. like cargo denim shorts with a Degeneration X t-shirt. <laughs> I remember you in a lot of Hawaiian shirts too. Oh, I would put the Hawaiian yeah. shirts over top of the oh, wrestling yeah. t-shirts, yes. He had long hair too. Yes. He drew the hair like down to his chin, like chin, shoulder length almost. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It looked good though. Your nice. hair looked good. You know, I have a, a Shannon actually, <laughs> I, might, I might share this one, we'll see. Um, I like how we're just reminiscing now and totally not talking about the question at all. It's because we don't know anything about it. Um, no, I can't find it. <laughs> that's all right. Um, okay, so I think the bigger question is, is it like a demand or like a market issue of us not getting into vintage stuff? Or is it like a supply issue? Like are there not enough pens around or whatever? Um, the answer is not really. Like there might be interest, there might be demand in these pens, but the reason that we don't get into it as much is not because I don't think there's interest in it. Because when I go to pen shows and I look at eBay and stuff like that, there's definitely interest all over the place in vintage pens. And I think they're cool. Pretty much most anybody that's like into fountain pens, you know, will find fascination in some of the vintage stuff that's been out there because fountain pens have been around for a long time. There have been innovations and stuff that have happened, but let's be honest, they haven't changed that much in 130 years or so. Yeah, there's been some evolution of materials and different things like that, but fundamentally it's kind of the same object. So there's all kinds of cool history and different materials and significance of design and, and things like that that have happened that are equally as fascinating to us as newer pen people as there would have been 80 years ago or whatever. Um, so I do think that there is interest, but that's not mostly the reason why we don't step into that. Um, so some of the biggest challenges that we have as Goulet pens for carrying vintage pens or not um, is probably the biggest one is just the inherent lack of like infrastructure and support 
around vintage products. Um, you know, these brands, they may not even exist anymore, or if they do, they could have been bought and sold. And so there's just like a, a very much a lack of that support that we currently rely on with our existing suppliers mm -hmm. and manufacturers to have like reliable, dependable information that we can speak authoritatively and commit to like, yeah, this is, this is what's happening. Um, when you get into vintage, all of that kind of just everything kind of becomes a story or a legend or you're relying on, you know, one person that kind of carried through a story and the original people involved are not around anymore or not involved in the pen industry. So it gets very difficult to get correct information, to have a reliable source of the products. You know, right now it's like if somebody's really interested in whatever, food nibs, we can look around and see like, can we get food aid nibs? That's probably a bad example because there's not a good supply of those. Um, what's a good one, Drew, here? I'm trying to look at, we, we got all these like special unique pens. Pilot Custom 74, because it's right here. Great. So if there's like a lot of interest in these Pilot Custom 74s, we can go to Pilot and say, let's order a bunch of Pilot Custom 74s. We know that each one produced is going to be reliable and predictable. We can put it on the website and people know that that's what they're going to yeah. get. What is this made out of? What is it available in? How long has it been? Like we have an authority on all of that. All we yeah. need to do is just relay that authority. There's there's warranty protection behind it. There is, you know, we can take returns. We can, we can really support that. Uh, with vintage, kind of all that stuff goes completely out the window because you basically don't know where it came from or honestly, if it's even... The real thing is it counterfeit was it a copy you know you have to really really know your stuff to like so much of a degree yeah we to need to hire to some expert some yeah just lifelong enthusiast mm -hmm. well-spoken intelligent yeah. expert not that that can't be done no it could definitely um, be done but, but but then you're also dealing in secondhand products you are dealing in secondhand products yes and there's no reliable supply of those. So you're basically hunting all the time to find these things, um, which is going to be or very buying, inconsistent. You know, you know, buy, buying back from individuals and, yeah. you know, which, and paying individuals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, it's it's much more challenging logistically, especially yeah. because of the inconsistency. And the fact that we our website wouldn't facilitate that. We'd need to find some other... You transactional would, means you basically would need like a marketplace like ebay yeah you know because <clears throat> every product and that that's another thing too is like um the inconsistency of of one product to another uh means that it's so much extra time and work uh just think of photography for an example you know you can have one pen but if it's got it's in different conditions and you know how many variants are there of you know like the parker 51 and like all these other things you know the 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 number of variants that we would have to have on a given product and how many how much time we'd have to spend looking it over, inspecting it, repairing it, the specialized knowledge that's required for that. And there's so many vintage pens out there. It would be nearly impossible for us to be expert enough to even be able to provide, you know, what I would consider to be reasonable support <laughs> for all, but maybe the most absolutely popular vintage pens. Um, and, and I will say too, like as much time as we spend on pens and as much as we purport to know or feel like we know, there is nothing more humbling than going to a pen show and walking by each table that's there and talking to people about the pens they have on their table and realizing that they know more about the pens on that table than I ever will. And it's like table after table after table after table. There's yeah. so much depth and so much knowledge, which is honestly part of what's so cool about this hobby is you can get deep into it. But I don't know anybody who's an expert on vintage pens. There's people who are experts on Parkers or Parker 51s and 45s. There's people who are experts on Esther Brooks and they have boxes and boxes of Esther Or maybe Brooks two and, brands, you know, like, hey, I do yeah. I do Pelicans and, and Parkers. Or sure, sure. I do, you know, I do Esther Brooks and Schaefer's, you know. Yeah, yeah. Or like somebody restores Schaefer snorkels and there's all kinds and of And there, there's some people that, that are close to being experts on everything because they're definitely out there, but yeah. man, they're few and far between. Yeah, but also like what would like pen shows exist for that fun vintage factor? Like, do we yeah. like why would we want to take anything away from that? Like, well, like think about any hobby, like any interest like this. I mean, if it's you know uh, automotives or I mean, I guess there are some collectibles that the vintage stuff can maybe be somewhat more standardized. I'm thinking about like I don't know. I guess if you have like collectible. Um, um, I don't know, like action figures and, 
Legos and stuff like that. Um, but then most of the time those are collectible. They're not things that are used. They're like in the box. Yeah. Which I guess that's that's one thing. I don't know. It's kind of a it's a very broad question that I'm kind of taking it as. I would say like I'm probably interpreting it as like we need to be the expert on everything. That's not necessarily true. If there were to be any approach that we would take, it would have to be like start with one very specialized thing and just try to know that well and we, do that well. We do, you know, force ourselves to be able to educate on our products. If we cannot educate yeah. on it, we don't do it. Yeah. So we will not sell something that we can't educate on. That we, that, that has been, yeah. um, that has literally roadblocked us from certain products. If we, mm -hmm. We've considered products and be like, can we teach about this? And we're like, ah, not really. Well then, no, we're not gonna carry something we can't tell a customer about. Yeah. Um, now, that, that's, those are some of the challenges. Um, what I have seen work you know, well enough for other people that do, because there are other retailers that do some vintage stuff. Um, the ones that I've seen do it most successfully are usually like the long established retailers who've been in the industry so long that they might have originally sold a lot of those vintage pens. So they, they have that knowledge way back there somewhere. So they're kind of like recalling it and they have that experience just like a lifetime of being in the pen business, maybe even like multi-generational. Mm -hmm. um, and so they actually have that kind of experience. So they can sell new stuff, but they have the, the kind of historical knowledge to have sold the old stuff too um, and might be familiar with those. Um, a lot of them brick and mortar stores as well. I can see brick and mortar, sh brick, brick and mortar stores or um, people who are doing a lot of pen shows. That is a much more conducive environment to doing vintage stuff because you are seeing exactly what the thing is. You're not having to photograph it and write a description about it and do all this extra work that we would have to do to list it online um, on like an individual product basis. There's a lot of extra time and resources that are required to do that. Whereas if you just have it in person, people can just pick it up and see what it is and then decide if they want it kind of right there. So I think that's part of the reason why there is such a big vintage following at shows is because that is just so much more conducive an environment. And like a brand new pen that. is more or less going to be the same no matter where you get it. Right. But a used vintage pen, there's going to be little details and stuff that no yeah. matter how well you photograph something, the prospective buyer is going to want to know what angle something else is at. Like what yeah. you didn't take a picture of the inside of the cap. I need to see the inside of the cap. Right. Right. So. Yeah. So, um, I think that that, you know, because we don't, we don't do a lot of pen shows or anything like that. That's going to be, um, that's going to be tougher for us. Um, and then the other thing that I've seen work well is like the higher end collectible pens, M you know, mostly from just like a business economic standpoint, if you have a really high end pen, you can afford to spend more time and energy on that product because you have essentially more margin to kind of work with. Um, there's the sort of collectibles and stuff like that, limited editions that maybe weren't used, stuff that's new in the box. It's more like a new product of sorts because it's more of a known quantity because it hasn't been used and written with and stuff like that. Um, as soon as stuff is like used and written with, it, it becomes you know uh, much more challenging to assess its value and communicate that. So there's a lot of challenges with it and um, it's it's not something I'll say like, no, we'll never do that because I'm not like fundamentally opposed to doing it. It's just, I struggle so much with logistically how we would do it well and do it to what we feel we would need to, to do it the way that we do the rest of our pens. What do you think um, is more realistic? Having a Goulet storefront or a Goulet online selling uh, vintage pens? Oh my gosh. Um, I don't think either is very realistic to Oh, happen. I know, but which one is uh, more realistic? Probably the online vintage would be more realistic yeah. in like 40 years <laughs> when I'm still shilling the Lamy 2000 and the custom 74. I, I, I want y'all to know that <laughs> I see your comments about, why won't, will you ever open a storefront? I'm not uh, ignoring it's you. It's so romantic and I would love to, but it's the logistics just, are No, it's not ever gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. And every we, we've answered it a couple times, but the answer is always just a resounding no. And you see Brian's life force literally leave his body and I don't wanna do that to him. We need him around. I mean, at least while, well, I'll say at least while I have kids that need like our attention as much as they do. Yeah. Like I, I, I would not be able to manage that. No, and I'm sorry. I don't no. want to. No, 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 no. It's okay. I mean, people do ask this a lot, and like inherently, I'm like that. Like uh, Rachel's an introvert. She would never want to work a store. So that right there is challenging. But like me, I'm like I love people. I love. Well, you wouldn't be the folks. one behind the counter. 
but uh, people would want us. You know, I would like, yeah, you'd be I there do love interacting night. with people. That would yeah. be really cool. Yeah. So we could have like Brian Day or whatever. You know, I could see that being fun. But, Can you dress up as you your know, own mascot? Like be outside the store, like spinning a sign, but like have yeah, a like giant a, Brian head, like a big foam Brian head. We got the sticker going. I mean, why not? We could, we could, we could come up with a Brian yeah, you, the costume. Log, the, the sign could be on the log, and you could just spin that around. <laughs> why not? Why not? Um, no, like, who's your mascot? It was Brian. Yeah, but who's in it? Yeah, Brian. <laughs> so I'll say like, you never know what could happen down the road, but it's not, it's not something that like I think we could do really well in the, in the near future. But um, cool. So if you have any other questions, you can always uh, drop it in the comments. You can shoot us an email at pencast at gulepens.com and we will see those and compile them and answer them. Okay, so that's it for Q&A. Now we have a special treat for you all, just as we've done uh, with a few different folks on our team so far. We have another Meet the Team, this time with... Wonderful Jenea, who you may have already seen on social, mostly doing a lot of our like short form stuff. So we're having her do stuff on TikTok and um, Instagram, YouTube shorts, but she's also helping us a lot with social posting and emails and these types of things. Um, she's newer to our team, uh, joined us mid last year, um, but she's learning a whole lot about it. Loves the fountain pen world and the community that uh, we have here. So um, Drew sat down with her and interviewed her. And I did indeed. now we're gonna show it to you all. I hope you enjoy. Okay, we're here with Jenea because we're recording and here she is now. Brian is no longer here. <laughs> Jenea is here and uh, we're going to meet you. Okay. Yes. Let's Everybody is going to meet you. So prepare to be met. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Jenea, what do you do here? I, I mean, know. I know, I think. You do. But, you know, for those who, who don't, what's your official title? Marketing I'm the marketing wizard? Sp <laughs> specialist? Specialist. Okay. That's so, not quite as exciting but every fine. time you see like cool posts on instagram or what about Twitter, a lame post on instagram is it that just might the cool be ones That's <laughs> <laughs> that might just, just the cool ones a cool post on instagram is Janaea. anything else that's definitely true that's very cool and has that been fun so far yeah i feel yeah. like summer camp like when you're like never in college ending. and you're like doing fun stuff and then everybody's like, it's not going to be like this in the real world. It's been like 13 years for me and I'm still kind of like waiting yeah. for it to start being bad. Uh, hasn't happened yet. Yeah. I'm like, I'm vibing. Hasn't so. happened yet. So this is your first experience as, you know, joining this company was a lot of our first experiences with fountain pens yeah. and the fountain pen world. Like. And it's, it's rare to not only say, oh, I work for a fountain pen company now, but you specifically, you're not only just working for a company that sells fountain pens, you yeah. are helping create content and engaging. And so it's like you're jumping in not just to the fountain pen world, but like way into the fountain pen world. Yeah. So like what, what kind of a shock was that? Because it had to have been just, there's nothing, you can't expect it. Yeah, it's not. And I always... I was always a pen person, like writing notes instead of typing them, but a big pen, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like a pen I stole from somebody's office. Yeah. <laughs> one of those good ones. You're like, yeah, yeah this one's I coming home with me. I might have to put this in my backpack. Yeah. But I'm, I, I try not to do that with servers, but anybody else is fair yeah. game. Servers or like <laughs> the people that intake at doctor's offices. Yeah, no, they need I try it. to be nice. They need it. They need but it. But car salesmen people. No, no, no. They don't need theirs. They deserve to get Sorry, no offense to... any car salesmen yeah, out sorry. there. But, but you know who you are. <laughs> you know, if you're a good car salesman, then I know that you know one of your coworkers that does deserve to have his pen stolen. Yeah, so, exactly. You know, we're talking about that guy. <laughs> yeah. We're talking about Steve. <laughs> oh, MG. No. Um, you know, I have noticed that about you because yeah. there have been, everybody that comes here, you know, we, you know, after 90 days, you know, you know, they actually get to pick a, you know, was it like 70, $80 pen, something like that. Yeah. And then, but before that, obviously we, we still want everybody to write with the fountain pen, especially if they're in customer care or marketing. Yeah. So we'll see like, all right, what do we have lying around? You know, what we got <laughs> here? Go ahead and just use this. You ended up with a Benu tattoo pen. Yeah. Which is something we never carried, but Brian had laying around. So yeah. he's like, here, Janae, I have this. And you have been writing with that I love thing. that thing. I love that thing. I love Banu period um, yes. because I like bold, glitz, glam. I had no shiny. idea. <laughs> wow. I do like anything shiny and loud. I usually like it. So the Banu tattoo is just so me. N not only that, but my my thing is I was, you're, what you said is completely validated about how you just like to write because yeah. you – I see you journaling all the time. Every meeting that we're in, you are just taking notes and taking notes and taking notes, and you're writing them. You're not yeah, typing them. I can't type 
I'm a, unfortunately part of Gen Z, so I be on my phone, tablet all day long, and I don't remember anything because everything's meant to be so quick. Oh. So if I type a note on my computer, I won't remember it. I mean, I know that like that that's proven, so I know that's a thing, and yeah. I know that exists, but I didn't really think about the fact that Gen Z might be a little bit more prone to kind of, you know, erasing that a little bit more quickly. Yeah. I never made that connection. It's like on TikTok, I'll scroll through for like 90 minutes and mm -hmm. I could have watched 100 videos. It's terrible. Don't yeah. doom scroll. Don't be like me. Yeah. No, we're, yeah. All, we're all in the same boat to one extent or the other. Yeah. But that's interesting because, yeah, so you really do write a ton. And, you know, even through, it's been fascinating to watch your fountain pen journey through you know, all, all of your learning opportunities, yeah. because no matter what happens, you know, no matter what you're learning, you just do not stop writing. Like nothing <laughs> discouraged you. I have seen explosions. I have seen messes, but you just keep on going. I just think it's fun. I don't, I don't know. I don't, maybe I'm a hands on person. So like writing and playing with the inks and I like shiny things. So putting the shiny ink in my pen, I'm like, they are all uh, shiny. Y'all, yeah. this girl does not use anything but shimmer inks. No, no, seriously. Do you? No. <laughs> right now in my pen, <laughs> I have a, oh my gosh, a Twisby Eco. I can't remember the color. The glow in the dark green? Yeah, glow green. Okay. Yeah, this is called glow green. <laughs> this is glow green and glow Emerald purple. Emerald of Shavor is in there. Mm -hmm. Nice teal shimmer. Yep. And then in my Lamy, uh, not Safari, the All Star. The All Star, yeah. Um, I have I Am a Cat wearing gold. You love I Am a Cat. It's the best ink. It is. It's a beautiful ink. It's the best ink. It really it's is. Like, it's, it's definitely the most popular wearing gold ink. Yeah. It's have oh. you have you inked up a pen with non shimmering ink? No. Maybe like the first week I was here. <laughs> so one, but Noodler's once you, black. <laughs> once you went, once you went shimmer, you did not go back. Oh my god. Once Adrian told me that there's like shimmer inks and you can mix and match and then the wearing gold potions yes yes so i turned you that noodlers right into, into that. noodlers oh. shiny <laughs> <laughs> you have been yeah everything is shiny and you, your hands have been covered in yeah. shimmery they're dirty now and, and you're just like no nope, i'm still going like nothing discourages you no it doesn't and and like it does you be shaking your pen flicking it playing with it ink will go everywhere you're yeah. like oh crap man whatever and you just keep on going it's at, writing with fountain pens ironically has made me less fidgety because ink used to just oh shh. yes it did and then thing i used to yeah. tap all day long i still do i like i shake my foot a lot yeah, or yeah. Play, i play with a coin or like fling i'll things. twist my hair over and over and over i and over. did that when i had more hair but i, I do that less now <laughs> my son does it archer will have like he does does yeah. his thinking thing where he takes his hair just kind of like He's you know, a, does that. Did. So it's all just like, <laughs> and we're like, dude, what are you doing? Oh, he was probably thinking about something. <laughs> so, but uh, no, it's entertaining. Um, so apart from joining the team here, you are a Richmond, Virginia native. Yes. But you left and you came back. Yes. How long were you away from Richmond? Two years. Two years. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what was the thing that you were most excited about returning to Richmond for? The pace, I think... Living as, some, a, as opposed to what? Like living in the DMV, it's so fast and you kind of have to watch What's your the DMV? Back. Like uh, the, where you get... DC, Maryland, Virginia, oh. and going from state to state actually. And mm. so it's like coming to Richmond, every traffic's good. 20 minutes, I'm like, I can deal with this. We were just talking about Northern Virginia during this week's Pencast episode and it was... It's god awful. Yeah. yeah I something. mean, a 30 minute trip could be 90 minutes. Oh. And then it's like, people drive so crazy out there. Yeah. Somebody ran in the back of me. I got to check. Mm. But that's not okay. You got to pay attention. Yeah. So being around here, it's like, I know everything like the back of my hand. I can take a shortcut. So yeah, I'm happy to be yeah, back. I don't feel like a ton has changed in a couple of years. We probably have like 40 more breweries because that just doesn't stop. It doesn't. I don't know why. but Oh yeah. my God. It's, you know, we all love a good time, but yeah. there's other things. Golly. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Concerts. Since yes. I've known you, you've gone to like, like five big concerts at least. Like, and I'm not talking about like, you know, like, oh, we're going to see this band that was popular back in the '90s. Oh, we're going to see Salt and Pepper. No, like, <laughs> you're talking about Drake, you, Beyonce. Yes, Drake, <laughs> Beyonce, and the, Lil Uzi Vert. And then you saw Drake and Beyonce in like the same month, two weeks apart. Well, a, walk me through that process. Like, was did you? 
Everybody came out with a great album that oh same my year. God. And then in May, I'm going to see Nicki Minaj. <gasps> and I got floor seats. I had to splurge. I love her. Oh my gosh. I just prefer like- That's when, like, those are like bucket list concerts. Yeah. So I'm excited. And you are scratching those off. Because they're- What are you going to have left after this? Just doing it again? Yeah. Hopefully would they're you, still would, making so music. Would you, would you see all of them again? Would you see Drake again? Would you see Beyonce? Yeah. Yeah. The thing I've learned at concerts is pay for good seats. Yeah. Beyonce, I had a good seat. Drake- I could have touched the top of the arena. I was so high up. So do you prefer like close up but still sitting or do you prefer just as close as you can get standing is fine? Close but sitting. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I, I like to be close, but I still like to be sitting. So for me, exactly. like the seat right behind the floor exactly. is ideal. Like that, that's the perfect seat. As long seat. as I can see, oh my God, there's Beyonce. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's all I need. That is, that is incredible. <laughs> That is incredible. So what about going back to the pen thing? Uh -huh. um, you being uniquely situated in jumping into the pen territory, but also jumping into such an observational area of the pen industry where you are looking at comments and feedback and yeah. like trying to understand why the heck are these things popular? And yeah. like, how can I best serve this community? What was the biggest surprise, just kind of like absorbing all that information and learning about the community and the hobby? The biggest surprise was the passion for yeah. me. It's crazy. Um, seeing how excited people got about something, how it brought joy to people. I don't know. I just thought that that was really awesome. Like this day and age, so many, it's easy to focus on the negative. Oh, yeah. And so just having something like the pen cast and I can get my pens and I can use my shimmer inks. I just thought that that was really awesome. And so I was just inspired by that, this little happy community that bothers nobody, just like their pens. And I wish it would catch on, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I all the time I see this, what we have and I read the YouTube comments. Yeah. I'm like, this is just so shockingly positive and healthy. And yeah. clearly this is something people want and they, they, they value this community and they value just that escape and, you know, being positive. But I'm like, exactly. when's it, when's it going to? overflow into other aspects. I'm like, hoping that's what I can oh, do, man. you know? Yeah. I just, I love to, like you said, journal and stuff. And so from the time I started, now I journal at home because I'm like, my hand is not cramping, glitter, ink. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So you, you found some practical benefits. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. Um, it's it's good to just dump your thoughts. And I just, I couldn't I, hopefully agree more. I, I want to encourage people to, to use a pen, like, Use fountain pens to dump their thoughts. You know what I'm no. saying? It's way easier on your hands. They're cooler than regular pens. Yeah, and if you and if you, and if you are completely open about your own thoughts and willing to just get everything out there, it's like free therapy. Exactly. Literally, it's free therapy. Because after I'm like, ah, yeah, I'm like, okay. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I feel better in a way. It's <laughs> stressful because you got to go and get it out. Yeah, exactly. But once you got it out, ah. <sighs> You know, yeah. you, you can you can breathe. It's it's definitely healthy. You can dead it. It's almost like as soon as you write it down, it's like, well, it's out of me. It's the journal's problem now. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Giving it to them. Exactly. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, so do you have a favorite pen thus far? It could be one you own or one that you are just in love with and haven't yet added to your collection. Hmm. My favorite pen that I own currently is the Banu Love Story. And oh, it's yeah. Purplish blue. That's right. Glitter, what can yeah. I say? Mm -hmm. What can I say? And it's just big. My, my nails, sometimes I have them really long. So if I have a really skinny pen, they'll stab yeah. me in my palm. Yeah. So you like the thicker ones? Yeah, I do. Okay. I just came up with a question. Okay. All right. Let What pen do you really like? Like you like, it's like, you know, a well known pen or something popular, maybe just one you like that you dig. It's got a good form factor. You'd like yeah. to own it, but it's not shimmery enough. And you, if you could add, just a crap ton of bling to a, an already existing pen model that doesn't mm. have a Benu-like shine to it. Which pen are you going to Benuify or Benuitize? You know which pen I really like? The Diplomat Magnum. Mm -hmm. I love that pen. It's a great pen, yeah. The snapping. Yeah. The, oh, so I, good. It has it's delicious. qualities that I really like, but it's so lightweight. It's light. It's is lighter than you think it would be. Exactly. Like it's not. I don't know if I'd call it light, but looking at it, you'd expect something heavier. And you get it in hand. Exactly. It, it's aluminum. Aluminum's not like yeah. heavy, but if yeah. that pen just had it, if it was just a little longer and a little thicker, mm -hmm. I would. I would really like okay. it because that's the pen I first wrote when I got here. Yeah. Um. When I didn't know any pens at all. Would you add? <laughs> would you, what, what would be your ideal 
if you're in, if we're inventing this heavier version of the arrow, Ooh. which by the way they do make a um a uh the the fired one. Have you seen that one? It's like no. it's 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 got that kind of like fired look where it's kind of like uh it looks like burned metal. You know how it kind of yeah. takes on that. So like the Twisby Lilliput has like a fire blue version. It's like that, but in the arrow. Got that you. one that one is stainless steel. Hmm. Yeah. So it's see. got some heft. So you'd probably like that I one. I like the metal pens. Yeah. Or if they're not metal, they have to be like physically big. Yeah. Because I don't know. I like the weight of my hand when I write. Yeah. And you said the nails thing. Like that's a practical benefit. Yeah. So would you add some shimmer to that or would you just be okay with? Yes. Yes. Of if course. I could design any pen, oh my gosh, it would be a shimmer explosion. <laughs> I mean, Banu's doing it for you. Banu? Like, could you add any more than they're possibly already doing? I don't know. I just might be able to. I bet you could, actually. <laughs> yeah, now that, now that I think about it. You can never go wrong with too much shimmer. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, <laughs> what is your oldest hobby? Something you've been doing for a long time that you still are super into? I would say reading. Oh, yeah. And, of course, as I got older, I wasn't reading as much because yeah. you're on your phone, you're working, going to school. But I really do try to keep reading and expand my vocabulary because there's other words besides good, bad, sad, mad. There is. And I just and love difficult. learning. I don't know. I, I was a spelling bee champ in third grade. I bought my <laughs> mom a Stephen King book recently that we're both okay. supposed to be reading together, but she finished it already. I'm still in chapter one. But it was a new word. Uh, and she sent me a message and said, I finished the book. I'm like, what the heck? But she also said, like, the author says this word a lot, and I don't know what mm. it means. It is obdurate. O-B-D-U-R-A-T-E. Obdurate. I, I did not know that, that word. Right? Yeah. And I'm like, ah, Mom, I don't know. Okay. Apparently it means stubbornly resistant and wrongdoing. Hardened mm. in feelings. Obdurate. Obdurate. But see? There you go. Yeah. And it's like you see it enough, you can include it in your vocabulary. And... I will try. I will try to obdurate. No, I will not be obdurate. Yeah, I was about I to say. I will not be obdurate. <laughs> and I will expand my vocabulary horizons. Yeah. Sometimes I'll read like a short story. Like I'll go back and read the short stories you had to read in high school, like the lottery or something like that. Oh, those are those are fun. I love those. And it's like, okay, I'm using my brain. I'm stimulating it. And then I don't have to read this huge long book. I could just read a nice short story. There's something to be said for that. I read a Star Wars book last year and it was so easy and yeah. it wasn't, it was just like, I'm not, I'm not stretching my brain, right. but I'm walking. Yeah. Like I'm walking. Some exercise. Right. And, it's, and <laughs> I think that, that that's understated. I think a lot yeah. of people think that if they have to read, they have to read like something, yeah. All you know, seven Harry Potter intellectual. Books. Like, yeah. No, like go, go just chill. Have a, like, like, I mean, we all have TV yeah. shows like that, right? Where exactly. it's just like a dumb thing to put on in the background. You can read like that too. Exactly. Totally. Exactly. And nothing wrong with read an old young adult novel either. Like, psh, go, yeah, go for it. anything. Absolutely. I love to read, so. That's fantastic. Yeah. All right. Um, what about your um, newest hobby or interest? Something that kind of recently developed that you're kind of getting into. This might be ironic, but thumb pins. That's not ironic because... It's not su it's not always a case. Like we've hired a bunch of people here over the years yeah. and ah, I'd say most of them do not get into fountain pens. Really? No, not most of them. Like now I will say that depending on the role we hire for yeah. it's not really someone yeah. you know experience differs. Like for someone in a marketing role or in a customer care role, I think it's more likely or they're more susceptible to the yeah. virus, I guess. <laughs> um, but the virus. so I don't think it was I don't know. When we interviewed you, I was like, I don't know. I, I think I think she'll get it. I don't know. Yeah. If she'll, you got way more hooked than I thought you would. Well, one, I'm kind of immersed mm -hmm. in it. You are. So I'm like reading comments and I'm seeing other people having fun. It's kind of like FOMO. Like, yeah. I want to have wanna fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like, I'm one of those people. It's like, once I'm into something, I'm all in. So yeah. I'm like, inks, Same. accessories, switching nibs and yeah. stuff like that. So it's just kind of fun. Like now I'm at home like, where's my... <laughs> do, do, you, do you find that you're more of like, do you get more excited about inks or pens? Ink. I, th I was going to say that. You seem like ink. You seem to get more excited about your inks. Because I'm like, if it's not broke type, I, I'm the type of person that's like, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Yeah. And so I'm like, if I already have like my news, I might get tired of it after a month and I'll switch out between like three pens. Yeah. But inks, 
I usually switch inks once a week. And the variety of ink is in, just insane. And I love that. And yeah. now with the wear and gold potions, you can make anything shimmery. So it's like Did you did you uh <laughs> do you have any of those? Like or are we just are you Man. or do we still are we still pulling from like the customer care? Customer care, pile? care bottles You're gonna, are almost out. I was about, I used one of those. <laughs> so I did a video on um on ink features and I no. noticed I'm like, man, this thing is almost empty. I'm the culprit. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else uses those. I thought it was customer me. care. <laughs> no. They used it how? when it first got here, and then I just dig in it. <laughs> Take it to my desk. How many do you so I know they say that's like a usually like a three to a one to ten ratio. Do you not <laughs> okay? I just... like pull the ink <laughs> syringe all the way back and I let it rip. <laughs> oh my god. And so when my pen stops working, I'm like, what the what's going on? That and is then magical. Somebody but cleans is, it. But you don't stop. You just keep right on going. You're like, all right, whatever. Get my feed brush. There we go. The most advanced fountain pen cleaning piece of technology <laughs> ever devised by mankind. Absolutely. That thing is Amazing. Oh, of course. It's better than the wheel. Oh, I'm 100%. <laughs> sliced bread. All 100%. Of that. Oh, yeah. I the just... microchip, the wheel, sliced bread, yes. feed brush. Feed. It's right there. Use that feed brush, clean your feed. 100%. Pen works like new. There we go. And you can add as much shimmer you as you are want. Who, you are who all of the scientists that we hired invented the feed brush for. Thank you. Yes. Nine out of 10 scientists agree that. <laughs> Whatever. All righty. Well, that that about does it. I think we covered a nice swath of awesome. entertainment. So we're all glad you're here. Um, I'm happy to be here. And I'm sure at least one person out there is glad you're here. I'm going to say at least a couple hundred. So uh, we're going to do that. I'm the person that's like responding to you on Twitter or Instagram. So if you see like from Janae, that's right. she's that's the one me. putting together the bulk of our emails as well, yeah. um, making sure that Brian and Rachel write the personal message yes. and. All that good stuff. Yeah. And they write so, the message. It's not me. You schedule the photo tasks, like which is crazy. Like, oh, you need to shoot this on white. You need to make sure we get this shot. Yeah. We have stock images for this, so we don't need to do that. Like, Janae yeah. does a lot of coordination efforts. So it is a ton. And she has helped out Rachel and Brian immensely because they were doing a lot of that. And yikes. Yeah. So we're glad to have you here. I'm and, so happy um, to be here. We will like, have you back on here at some point as okay, well awesome. because I will have some shimmery questions for you because Brian and I don't use shimmer as much. Yeah. So next time we need a shimmer correspondent. I'm the um, shimmer guru. It's going to be you. Shimmer connoisseur. Mm -hmm. Shimmer queen. <laughs> All righty. Back to you, Brian and Drew. All right. Thank you, Drew and Jenea. <laughs> the Drew of the past was That's right. <laughs> quite dashing uh, to be to be young again. <laughs> That's right. Uh, last week was. Oh, I feel like you've <laughs> like grown so much. I since know. Then, gosh, right? I wish I had all the hair I had last week. Just think of all the things Ooh. you know now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> all right. Want to talk about what's happening? I think so. Ooh. Let's do it. All right, Drew. All right. Um, well, my wife started a newish job. Oh, um, couple newish job. Couple months ago, maybe two months, something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Five weeks ish. I don't know. It hasn't been long, but we went to her annual office party. Oh, uh, okay. Went to Maggiano's, which is hey, we, where we've we done that. Yes, yeah, same same room back there and <laughs> really? everything. Really? Well, oh, they didn't they that. didn't take up both rooms. We took up both rooms. They just had one. We of the didn't rooms. always take up both rooms either. We started out. Oh, it was okay. Just one room. Yeah, gotcha. Back in the day. Um, so we did that, and uh, that was pleasant enough. It was nice to kind of like put you know uh, faces to the names because I'd have heard her talking about you know her new coworkers. You know, I don't know. I'm, very deep. I'm like, oh, that's the one with the thing, and that's the one that you know said the thing, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. That's so, the one with the bo, and that's the one who stole my pen. And right? No, yeah, yeah. All yeah. that stuff. Um, okay. But it was definitely exhausting. You know, I was. Just oh come kinda, on, Mister Extrovert here. I'm not Mister Extrovert. <laughs> I just kind of sat there for a while, you know, and just kind of zoned out and <laughs> let the clock tick away. And, <laughs> But uh, it's a small company um, yeah. run by a husband and wife team, uh, found, okay. you know, about the same size as ours. Okay. Um, you know, they you know talk about culture a lot. So it's actually a really nice, uh, mm. really nice place. And I'm really cool. happy that she is at a company that, mm. you know, at least talks about culture and values and stuff like that. It's 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 good. And um, yeah. I'm optimistic for her. So that was nice. Um, yeah. Got to enjoy that. Uh, drove um, my son to my brother's house, who lives very close to me. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, coincidentally, that night was the night of a San Francisco 49ers game, which both my brothers always get together and watch. I'm the brother that does not like football, so um, mm. I'm not a part of that. But mm. uh, 
Chad and why Zach. Why San Francisco? That's that Zach has always loved other... San Francisco. Why? why? I don't know. Like, Even as a kid, he was like on the he, other side of the country. No, like, I mean, I mean, what locality shouldn't matter about fandom anyway because it has say, nothing to do with who actually plays in that team because none of them are actually from that city anyway. That's true, but still, like, there's a vibe, you know, when you go. I don't understand the vibe. It's different I for us. Have. Like, here in Virginia, we don't have any professional sports team in Virginia. Kind of the commanders. Yeah, but that's not even Virginia. It, that's in Maryland. Less. Is it really? Yeah, the stadium's in Maryland. Oh, God, I so don't know. So there literally is no professional sports no, team I in don't, Virginia. I don't, so I don't we, we, I don't know, for better or worse, we kind of get to, like, pick whatever team that we want yeah. to be. Like, I remember in fourth grade, I decided I wanted to be a Blue Jays fan because somebody was like, oh, what, who, what baseball team do you like? And I was like, I don't know. Well, I like blue for one, go figure. And I was like, oh, yeah, my family's like Canadian. So Toronto, there you Canada. Go. And then as soon as I got asked like one question about it, I was like, I'm out. I can't do I can't do this. I didn't yeah. know anything about that. I, just knew I that did the same the- thing because my brothers <laughs> were into football. And yeah. uh, I was like, OK, cool. Well, how about the, the guy on the 10, 10, 3, 2, 1 commercial has a little mullet. His name's Doug Flutie. He was he's on the bills. That's all like that. They're blue. Well, I like him. There you go. Doug Flutie. I bought a Doug Flutie jersey. Hey. And I'm like, okay, no, I, I can't do this anymore. I don't like football. <laughs> I tried because I feel like I should because everybody likes football. And I just now, I, yeah. I, I that's no. But anyway, so they were both over there. So Archer got to spend some time with uh, Chad and Zach while they were doing the football thing. But I get home from the event and there was a UFC that night as well. And they're like, Drew, do you want to stay for watch some MMA? And I was like, no, I'm sorry. I love y'all, but I'm I just want to go home and play video games alone. And that's what I did. Yeah, I finished Spider-Man Miles Morales and I started God of War Ragnarok and that is exactly what I wanted out of my evening. There you so go. I just kind of like, because that, that, that is me. Like, you know, it, in certain moments I, I can definitely seem extrovert, but yeah. it does drain me and I huh. recharge by being alone and playing video games or watching a movie. That That then. is that is a life force. Um, so yeah, I did, did some of that this weekend. Uh, actually, I didn't watch any of my movies, but I did buy two new, because I mentioned I was gonna try to buy some more um, physical media discs. Right, yeah. Bought two new 4K Blu-rays. Um, so these are my you know first 4K movies, essentially. And I'm trying to pick movies that I don't already own in physical media form and movies that will look really good, movies that were shot in like crazy high definition and stuff yeah. like that. So I choose Blade Runner 2049, the uh, newer one with Ryan Gosling. Okay. And is that Harrison. good? I heard yeah. it was decent. Yeah, it was good. It was very good. I haven't seen the original or um, the new one either. And then likewise, another crazy sci-fi movie, I picked the Dune movie, um, the, okay. the newer one, which is very sci-fi-y and mm. kind of hard to follow, okay. but looks amazing and sounds mm. wonderful. Like okay. it's just a very immersive experience very mm. grand like they mm. hold the shots really long all this the set design's incredible mm. nothing looks fake or you know mm. crappy it's just it's a fun movie to just kind of immerse yourself into okay normally the really hyper sci-fi like i kind of like the goofy sci-fi like star wars that's just kind of like s- science fantasy you know yeah. really um but the complex intelligent sci-fi has usually been a little bit too much for me i like dumb sci-fi Interesting. um but okay. th- this this is this this kind of pulled me in. Huh. So it's just, it's very pretty, very beautiful. So okay, got those. Um, and then uh, Shannon had a bunch of rehearsals. So, uh, you know, there was that, but it gave me the opportunity to go by Waffle House for lunch. And uh, I took Archer to Waffle House. He spilled orange juice all over his um, coat. And, oh, no. uh, but we had a great time. It was a delicious Waffle House experience. And the food was phenomenal. It was a really good batch. Huh. Very good batch. The grits were just drowning in butter Mm. and it was marvelous so that was delightful um and then uh we did have some time for shannon the next morning on sunday morning she didn't have rehearsal until two so i was like honey we can do because on saturday the night of the day of her party she had to spend all day at the office doing like an annual meeting as well oh my god so they had like a meeting that then went into the event so she was just like with that and rehearsal, she just feel like she didn't have a weekend. So I was like, honey, yeah. we can do whatever you want Sunday morning. And she said, I want to go to Target and I want to go to Marshall's. And I want to shop. I was like, okay, that's fine. So we did that. Let her just have what she wanted. Uh-huh. Um, and that was fine. Uh, you know, but we did take the plunge while we were at Target mm-hmm. and pick up an air fryer. Because hey. we, have, we, have, we, we are late to the party on the air fryer. I know the air fryer craze happened kind of like more or less during, you know, 
pandemic ish times, you know, yeah. I feel like everybody was, was I getting one during that time. Yeah. But like everybody was getting an air fryer back then. Yeah. And we were just kind of like, ah, I don't know. I don't know where to put it. Blah, blah, blah. And then the last time we were at Target, I saw a couple of them and we're Shannon is a big fan of pizza rolls. Arch is a fan of chicken nuggets. Perfect for that. Basically so, anything you would put in a toaster oven. Yeah. It's like perfect for that. Which we we don't have one of those either. Yeah. So. Y'all still don't have a microwave, do you? No, no microwave either. Oh my gosh. I don't know how yep. you do it, man. I don't know how you do it. Yeah. I mean, just I reheat. That is like a daily tool in our I house. reheat everything on a skillet. But uh, I was there and I saw some potential and I said to myself, you know what? I don't, I, I want to spend $50 on one of these. I don't want to spend more than 50 on this. Like yeah. I just, I don't know if I'm going to use it. I did the same thing. And uh, lo and behold, this weekend, I found a good one of the Power XL brands. Uh, it was a smaller mm-hmm. one, but not the smallest. I mean, it was on sale for uh, 50 bucks. Nice. So went ahead and got it. Have you used it yet? Yes. Is it awesome? Eight minutes for pizza rolls, Brian. Yeah. Eight minutes. Yeah. And they came out. That would out. be what, like 25 minutes in oh, the yeah. oven? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. They came out perfect. Last night, Shannon texted me on her way home from rehearsal. And says, could you, would you mind? And I'm just sitting there playing video games, being all lazy. And I can just hear, she just went from work to rehearsal. Yeah. It's like 10 o'clock at night. She's like, I would just love some pizza rolls. I'm like, honey, I got you. Boom, dump, bam. And she came home. They were ready. Nice. And they were cooked to perfection. That's awesome. It was like the best medicine she probably could have, could have, could have had. Like pizza rolls when you absolutely need them most. Thanks to the air fryer. So I'm yeah. I'm already sold on that thing. I'm I'm very, very pleased with it. That's awesome. We yeah, it's like we did the same thing. I think it was like we we bought it as like a Black Friday thing at Target years ago. It was kind of an impulse buy for me. I was like, I've heard a lot about these things. I don't know if we're gonna use it. It's gonna take up room on the counter. We're probably gonna shove it away. Yeah, just like that's we have what I was a bunch thinking. of other appliances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it gets regular use. But I'm not like cooking like meals in that thing. No, I'm no. I'm like, no, no. oh, we need to do some tater tots. Yeah. But I don't want to take twenty minutes in the oven. It takes like seven, eight minutes in the air fryer. Yeah. And like done. I'll or it's like it. um, egg rolls, like Chinese food. Mm-hmm. You microwave it for like 30 seconds and then throw it in the air fryer. Mm. So it like cooks it from the inside a little bit and then you crisp it up. Or it's like if we're bringing home, you know, some kind of like fast food that has French fries with mm. it or something, throw the fries in there for a minute or two, crisp them right back ah, up. Love it. It's just a great experience. Yeah. Love it. So. Another thing I should have done when we went over Chad's house to pick up Archer. I left my pizza cutter at his house mm. like maybe a year ago. I've okay. been over his house a half dozen times since then. Just haven't thought of it. Never get it. Mm. And so finally we bought another pizza cutter at Target. You just bought another one. I you were kn- there. Yeah. We were literally there the previous evening and we still, and he hasn't said anything. Like I know mm. it's there. Yeah. I know he's got my pizza cutter. He probably uh, forgot that it was. Oh yeah. Yours, no, he don't, you know? he don't know. He's probably got like three of them by himself. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's part of why I have so many hammers. Is I like either forget that I like loan them to people, or I put it somewhere and then I lose it, and then I'm just like, you know what? I need another one. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, so, well, I've been like using that. I've been using one of those Ulu knives. It's like an Alaskan. It's like a curved blade with a wooden okay. handle. Yeah. And one time, like when we first got it, I said Alaskan Ulu knife in like an Australian accent. <laughs> I don't know why. And then Shane's like. It's not Australian. <laughs> and so every time since then, just to yep. just to troll her, I say, Oh crock, it's an Oscar <laughs> Ulu knife, you know. <laughs> and uh yeah, she hates it. So mm. obviously I have to continue that. Of course. Yeah. You gotta troll your significant other. I'm sorry for all of the Australian folks. I don't mean any offense. I'm just terrible. <laughs> also, I was uh, some, someone told me in the comments that uh, I should say Aussie and not Aussie. And Aussie? It, do I have permission to do that? Is like, is that okay with you Australians? Because I feel like that's just me trying too hard, but I don't know, it makes me feel weird. Like it says Aussie, but I should say Aussie. But then that feels weird. I don't feel like I'm being genuine when I say that. And I feel like I'm like trying to sound like mm. I'm from Australia, but I'm not. Is that okay? Could someone mm. give me permission? And I'll start doing it. If someone can officially like be the ambassador for Australia and give me I feel like Australian written permission are, to say Aussie instead of Aussie. If the stereotype holds true, I would say they're generally pretty laid back. So or they just I don't, don't think care at all. I don't think they're going to jump yeah. on you too okay. much one way or the other. All right. Well, thank you. I could be wrong. All right. <laughs> well, either jump on me or tell me it's okay. <laughs> there you go. All right. That's it for me. All right. Um, I had a fairly uneventful weekend. I was slightly ill. Not real ill. Yeah. Slightly ill. Yeah. It's a little under the weather, so 
Um, you know, we had visited Rachel's family. Some of them got sick. Mm. So I was like starting to get sick. So we were like, all right, we will work from home on Friday. And I like was not feeling great. I COVID tested all this stuff. Nothing ever came about that. Never got a fever and any of that kind of stuff. But I was just kind of like, Bleh. yeah, not when we great. had our one on one last week, your eyes weren't all the way open. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm tired a lot anyway, because I don't get enough sleep, but they looked more, doesn't they look less I'm open than usual. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm mostly over that. I'm probably yeah. like, probably like 90% right now. Yeah. Um, but again, it was nothing like crazy. So you don't look as bad as you did. Thanks. <laughs> I did get a haircut though. It was getting awfully. Dude, I liked it. I liked it. You came in with that part. Yeah. I love that. I that you should like, be. You like the part. Yeah. I know. You like that. It looks slick. Yeah. Yeah. But when I didn't have it gelled, it was a bit much. I like that too. <laughs> I like it. It's looking a bit, a bit. Uh, at forty, Brian, or 80s. the precipice of forty, I think that as a gentleman with a full head of hair, it is your responsibility to just keep it floofed and wild at all times, out of respect for people like me who just don't have that option anymore. Okay, you still, got, you still you're still holding on there. Mm. It's you know, every time I, it <laughs> rains on my head, mm. there's less resistance there than there used to be. Mm. When I hear it, when I feel a drop like on my skull, I'm like, whoa, what happened? It's supposed to hit hair first. Mm. But it's like even on even the areas where it hits hair, it just goes right through because there's just not enough there anymore. I don't have yeah. any more. Yeah. I don't even more rain defense. Mm. That, that's how you know. Yeah. That's how you know. I've got the, the every, everybody in our family has got like the beaver pelt ah, kind hush. of thing going on. I don't yeah. want to hear it. When I do get my hair cut, they actually, in order for it, like the gel, because like my hair is so heavy <laughs> that you, it'll flop down. They have a special like pair of scissors that they use to like thin it. My goodness. I know you don't want to hear Oh, no, that, I've seen those. I've seen I, those. I, I, I get my yeah. hair thin. Speaking of vintage, <laughs> you still you still use like 1999 style gel too, don't you? Oh, I use some hard. It's that like it's like old super school. Glue. Yeah. yeah, I remember. Yeah, that was that was the thing. That's then. what I need. My hair, like I, I try other products, like these like you know cream type things. Right. That you put. I'm like, this is just no. I need all glue. it does is make my hair like like uh, like feel stiff. Yeah. Like and not well. I mean, this does. It's too, stiff. Obviously. Yeah, it's super stiff. But it makes it feel like dry, and then the stuff kind of like flakes off. It doesn't uh. tame it at all. Okay. It just makes it. <laughs> feel really gritty okay you know what i mean so like i need like the super glue hair gel to tame this mink um <laughs> <laughs> these are good problems to have i do have a lot more grays though as i'm getting my hair cut i'm like oh dang oh yeah i was playing There's around with that. i was playing around with photoshop enough. ai making funny faces for you and yeah. it gave you gray facial hair oh, that's it, cool. it like picked up on that I will say I had I had like a six day scruff going on too because um, I like wasn't I think I shaved like for the pen cast and I hadn't shaved the rest of the week and then I went into the weekend so I had it going on I'm like I'm like pretty salt and peppery in the beard nice like beard and and sideburns and neck and all that and my eyebrows there you go Mr. It's Fantastic pretty hardcore um, yeah so that was a thing um, that said I'm still keeping up with the saxophone I am playing that like a fool. Um, just lots of scales and drills. A saxy fool. Nothing. I'm a one saxy fool. <laughs> um, yeah, still enjoying it. Still keeping up with it. Nice. I'm pretty proud of myself for, for that. And yeah, just not doing anything glamorous. Just because I had a lot of music. I was practicing those like Christmas songs and like, stuff like that. And then Christmas ended and I was like, well, that seems weird now. Um, so literally I'm just practicing drills and scales. I'm like, I'll get better at that, and then yeah. that will translate to whatever fundamentals that I want to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's see here. No outside adventures. It's way too cold and way too wet. So I have done basically nothing outside. So more on that down the future. Down the future. Mm -hmm. Yep. There you down go. Down the rabbit hole. Down the hole. Down future. the hole. Um, took down our Christmas tree finally, and lights that we had outside because we got like a bunch of like ice and snow and stuff like that. I was like. That day, I was like, let me take down the outside lights. I took the... took everything down just in enough time. Yeah, same, same. It was like two hours before all the junk came. Nice. And I was like, got it all down. I was like, okay, cool. Um, let's see here. What else? I have been using my Pilot Custom Yurushi a lot and been really enjoying it. It's been like my daily carry, basically. I'm surprised you didn't Which get is a, that sooner. The thing's a monster. Yeah. It's expensive. That's why I didn't get it sooner. It is, but like but, you used to spend more money on fountain pens. You've taken a long enough break. I think you can justify some of these purchases. Your 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 frequency, you know, since, you know, the early 2010s is 
drastically it ebbs and flows. It ebbs yeah. and flows. Most of the time now, it's like exclusives and stuff mm. that I like want to keep for historical reference and like prototypes and stuff that we're doing. Um, this one's kind of rare because yeah, just to buy like a regularly available yeah. pen, you know, I'm like I'm a lot pickier than I used to be about it. You knew but you were gonna love this one though. I knew no it, no doubt, and I have been yeah. enjoying it. So. Literally, literally, that's all. Well, I'm you had many opportunities to test drive it, and you knew it was a sure thing. Every time I use it, I was like, yeah. I need one of gonna these. This is going to have to happen one day. Um, and then, more interestingly, I, I can't remember if I talked about this on the Pencast last week, but I, Composition Notebooks came up, and I told you that I found my composition notebook from eighth grade. Composition Notebooks came up, but you told me offline. Okay, so I didn't mention this to you all, but I found a composition notebook of mine that was like, I guess it was from like English class or something. And there's all these writing prompts that we had to do. And I read through it and it is hilarious. Some of the writings. So I flagged a few things. I'm not going to read a ton of it. Um, but I, I did think that it was noteworthy of just sharing some insights into the, uh, who, may, who makes that notebook? Uh, this, that's a good question. It does, does it even have a, I don't know that it has a brand. Oh, on it. Wow. It's got a barcode on the front. Nope. Just literally has no brand. Wow. So I don't know who makes this composition <laughs> okay. notebook. Um, yeah. But anyway, probably was bought at like a drugstore or a dollar store or something like that. Um, anyway, so it's got a bunch of writing prompts. I flagged a bunch. I won't read them all, but I do have a couple that are kind of interesting. And the reason it's so funny is because my son is now this exact age. So getting to read some of what I wrote at his age is just so trippy because I'm seeing so much of myself in him. Um, so some of the more interesting things, I was absolutely obsessed with cars. Um, and the reason it's funny and I wanted to share this with you all here is because we've talked before about how if you have a tendency to want to collect things and like be obsessed, have like obsessive hobbies, um, that's probably going to translate into multiple different areas of your life. And then you might end up in the fountain pen world. And I just think it's really interesting looking back, like, you know, this is what 20, how long ago was this? This was 1998. So however many years ago that was, close to 30 years, uh, 25 years, yeah, because I'm 25 years older than my son. Um, yeah, it's just really interesting. So um, I was absolutely obsessed with the McLaren F1, as you know, Drew. And Drew knew me at this time, too. Um, so I have a few journal entries I want to read to you all. Um, this one is called The Best Gift I Hope to Receive. I hope to receive a McLaren F1. Yes, it is a car. The fastest car and most expensive car in the entire world. And look at how I wrote those. That's like, a big world. Very huge letters there emphasizing it. The price is amazingly steep, but I think it's worth every penny. And going from zero to 60 miles per hour in 3.2 seconds and a top speed of 231 miles per hour, $1.6 million is a bargain deal. Yeah. So, and then I wrote some more, but it wasn't as entertaining. I remember you repeatedly telling me that it was a million dollar car. Like, it's a million dollars. Because it was a big deal back then. And I will say now, I still follow some like car channels and stuff. Those cars sell for like $15 million now. Like they are... It, it it historically has been like a legendary car. So my obsession is has been justified with that car. <laughs> um, okay, this one I thought was hilarious. It's called, If You Were Alone on Earth. If I was alone on Earth, I would at first be thrilled. I would drive down to the BMW dealer and take a Z3. I believe that the Bond movie, Goldeneye, with the Z3 had come out uh, fairly recently. And I was pretty obsessed with that. That makes sense. Uh, I would drive it up and down Broad Street, which is here in Richmond, at 100 plus miles an hour, only stopping at Dunkin' Donuts to have my meals. <laughs> I would then drive to the Richmond airport and hijack a 747 and fly it to England. <laughs> in England, I would hijack a McLaren F1 <laughs> and drive over to the Autobahn in Germany, where I would have a ball. I would eat, sleep, drive, and have fun until I felt lonely, where I would then die miserable and by myself. Someone read this and invented <laughs> Grand Theft Auto. I mean... There you go. 13-year-old Brian. This wow. is the thing. In particular, I was like, and then I would die miserable by myself. <laughs> I, was, I was very self-aware, I guess. Like, it'd be fun for a while. Um, okay, so this is a good one. Uh, it's called An Obsession. 
Mm. It's literally the next entry in my journal. Uh, hello, if you know anything about me, you probably know I'm obsessed with cars. If you would start, if sorry, if you start talking about cars, I'll blab your ears off with incredibly frustrating <laughs> car jargon and records, speeds, slalom records, braking, acceleration time, and forever more information that I'm sure you wouldn't care to hear. <laughs> you are self-aware. Oh uh, yeah. I also have a car collection with 14 1 18th inch scale models, two 1 24th scale models, 18 1 36th scale models, and over 200 1 64th scale models, that's like Hot Wheels size, all still in the package. Altogether, I would have to say that I spent over $700 on cars in the past year. I never knew you had a Hot Wheels collection. Yes. In the package? Because I went to a store uh, it was like a hobby, like collection, like trading store. Like, so they had like, you know, trading cards yeah. and action figures and stuff like that. And I saw some like old, old, old Hot Wheels in the package. And I was like, I should do that. I love cars. I can buy cars now and save them and I'll be rich. Not thinking like, oh, inflation. Like those cars really just probably have kept up with inflation. So I bought a whole ton of cars, like all Hot Wheels cars and other scale model cars of the cars that I was obsessed with at the time. So like the McLaren F1. Where are they now? The Ferrari F50. I think I still have them all. They're in like a box in my attic. I don't know if they're in great shape because I haven't like kept them in like a heat, like a air conditioned space, huh. but I still have them. I should go dig those out. You've never mentioned the car yeah. collection. Like the I was really obsessed collection. with that for like a year or two and then I stopped. That's a whole lot of damage for a year or two. Yes. Well, my parents had a business and I worked a lot in the business. So I earned a lot of my own money and I blew it all on car models. <laughs> Go figure. And you do the scales for each one of them? Oh, like you're, you're I, not like, oh yeah, I have this many Hot Wheels. I have this many. Well, I think about that with Joseph with like Pokemon stats or whatever, Sonic the Hedgehog and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh yeah, I did the exact same thing at that age. Mm -hmm. And I was self-aware that like, I didn't care if you wanted to hear about it. I just so you, wanted to talk about it. That's why you're a spreadsheet nerd and I'm not. Like you had mm -hmm. that, you had that the stats. data mindset early on. Yeah. And then last one, this is not car related. There's a lot. I mean, I talk about how much I shoehorn the McLaren F1 into this journal. Um, but this one I just thought was really funny because it just shows goes to show my, my creative writing throughout my school experience. Uh, it's called The Touch. So think about like the Midas touch. Okay. So we had to come up with a touch that we could it, have. I would touch and everything would okay. become a McLaren F1. No, I didn't do that. Um, <laughs> but you'll see, you'll see a pattern here in a second. Uh, I would want the touch of filet mignon with sauteed mushrooms covered in hollandaise sauce with a pinch of salt baked in the finest white wine with a side of mashed potatoes, seasoned corn, and macaroni with cheese. Any inanimate object that I touch would then turn into filet mignon with sauteed mushrooms covered in hollandaise <laughs> sauce with a pinch of salt baked in the finest white wine with a side of mashed potatoes, seasoned corn, and macaroni and cheese. I would see no downside to this except that I would eventually die fat and happy. <laughs> and it filled the page. You're not kidding. Those you are really hilarious. What, you could see what I was doing. When you told me this these, is how I got through school. Was when you like, told me these were really <laughs> funny, I was like, okay, well, they're probably moderately humorous, but probably very funny to Brian. But no, those are all legitimately hilarious. It's funny because like you can see what I'm doing as a kid, like working in whatever the obsession is and yeah. just spouting stats that's not good writing, but it's entertaining. Thinking of like my teacher reading this was probably like, what a friggin' 13 year old boy. Um, and then like, obviously like you can tell them like fill in space and repeating things and elaborating unnecessarily in certain parts because I just needed to like fill them. I love that there are constants in the universe. Yeah. And my kids do the same thing. It's just really, really funny. Nice. So nice little insight into young Brian fun. there. I thought that was pretty, pretty good. Um, anyway, so that's, that's all I got there. And, uh, that's kind of, that's kind of it for me for the, the personal stuff. So, all right. Yeah. So maybe I'll get up to more things now that I'm, you know, less under the weather. Um, oh, and we also just did like a bunch of boring housework. That's also like a thing. So eh. not much to talk about, but I spent a lot of time cleaning the house. <laughs> okay. Um, got a quick um, thing update and then we can wrap it up. Okay, well, we have a video, two videos actually. You will have shot a What's New video in the future slash that's the in plan. the past. Um, and you're gonna be showing off some of these wearing goal links. I believe that's the case. So yes, we're go going to go to yeah. Neverland. Yeah, very good. Um, and then we have another video on refilling the pile of varsity, which was inspired by the Pencast. So it's a much more brief, comprehensive video that shows you in better detail than what we did. So um, you can check that out. Um, that's kind of it for company updates. I couldn't really think of anything else hyper relevant that's on the, on the horizon, but nah. there we go. Um, um, we can go ahead and wrap this up. 
All right, I want to thank you all for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing and ask us more questions so we can keep on keeping on with the show. Uh, check out gulipens.com for fountain pen ink paper needs and subscribe to all our channels because we are posting all kinds of stuff. And my random fun fact, this is not like hyper verified, but I looked at a bunch of different Google sites and found that- It's 2024, it we don't worry about verifying facts anymore. Fair enough. Um, I was curious, like, what's the background of the composition notebook? Oh. We've been talking about that a lot le recently. And I found a lot of the people with the same, a lot of different sites with the same info. I couldn't find like a definitive like site that I could like really trust, like a, you know, dot gov or anything, you know, that could be like, feel good about it, but everybody kind of the same story. So I pieced together some information. So fact check me. Okay. But, um, so these marbled composition notebooks yeah. seem to go back maybe around 180 years Dang. originating in France and Germany, but really it's kind of more known uh, to especially have gained popularity um, uh, around the 1880s. That's when it came over to the US and started becoming mass produced, I believe. Um, but the original design kind of, it hasn't really changed that much, this kind of like marbled look. Um, Mead, Norton, and Roaring Springs were kind of the ones that led the charge uh, in the US for uh, mass producing these things. Um, and in, apparently, in particularly, Mead really blew up with it in the 70s in academia. And, you know, us growing up in like mostly in the 90s, um, the composition notebooks, that was like such a standard thing. It was just like it would be on the list of things to get for class. And hence, I have that example right here. Um, but yeah, apparently there's no copyright on the marbled cover design. So that's part of why the design is so prominent is it's essentially fair use and any brand can go with it. And you know, that's part of why it's so proliferated. Is that the right word? <coughs> to like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's been proliferated yeah. because you know, it's nobody, nobody owns that design. So huh. um, yeah, kind of neat. So. They're actually quite, they're, they're quite a bit older than I had realized, to be honest with you. Significantly older, yeah. I would have um, said like, oh, the 1960s or something. No. Wow. They've been around for a minute. Wild. So, yeah. And probably, you know, I don't know how like global it's been. I mean, it's, it's been around that long and it didn't originate from the U.S., but here in the U.S., like everybody knows what these are. Mm -hmm. um, probably because if you went to school, you probably had used them. So I'm curious, you know, if y'all are from other countries and whether you know these or if this is standard in your countries, I'm kind of curious. So anyway, little facts about the composition notebook. So um, hope y'all have a wonderful week. We'll be back at you next week. Hope you've enjoyed this and right on.